Uh, attendees for the session will also be getting continuing legal education credit if you're a lawyer in the room and you need some CLE. If you do need your CLE, make sure that Donna's out at the registration desk. You sign the form there to get the credit. Uh, for those of you on the webinar, uh, there are going to be opportunities for you to enter a code. Uh, you're going to have about 30 seconds to enter that code. And in order to get the credit, you need to do that. Um, New York, New Jersey, and Kansas attendees applying for CLE also need to fill out an attorney affirmation form and write down the course code. Um, the attorney affirmation form and today's slides can be obtained on the resource aspect of the webinar, and if you have trouble finding it, again, please ask our tech people some questions. Uh, for New York attorneys, those of you with less than two years of experience will not be eligible for CLE today. Uh, completed at attorney affirmation form should be emailed to Jason Swabby at J, S as in Sam, W as in Will, A as in Apple, B as in Boy, Y as in Yellow, at Foley.com. And CLE certificates will be sent out in about eight weeks. For those in the room in front of you, you have a booklet. And in that booklet, there's the agenda. There are the slides for each presentation. There's a list of acronyms. And there are the bios of all of our speakers. Uh, for some of the noted presentations, you'll note that the slides are fairly detailed. You know, there's always an issue of do you give detailed slides and run the risk of reading from the slides or giving the information on them or uh, being a little bit uh, more general in your slides and giving more information. Uh, we find that people tend to like to have this as a resource throughout the year, so we tend to do more detailed slides for most of the presentations. And uh, we might not cover all of the information that's on the slide, but we want to make sure that you have that as a resource. The glossary of acronyms at the back only identifies those acronyms that are used in the presentations. As you all know, government contracts is the world of alphabet soup. And if we gave you all of the acronyms there are, that book would be much thicker. Uh, since you have in front of you the bios for each speaker, I am not going to today give lengthy introductions. Feel free to review those and get to know all of our speakers. Also in front of you, you have critique forms. We do ask that you please fill that out as the presentations are going along and hand it to Donna at the end of the seminar today. We do appreciate your feedback and want to incorporate your comments for next year's event. If you are online, you are going to, uh, to the right of your screen, there's an evaluation that also could be used to provide feedback, and we ask that you take a moment to fill that out. Well, given that Foley sponsors or, or pays for this event and all the food, uh, we want to take a minute to give you a few words about Foley and Lardner. Foley is a full-service law firm, and we have around 1,100 lawyers in 24 different offices, including offices in Europe, Asia, and Mexico. In April of 2018, Foley combined with another law firm, Gardier, and that expanded our footprint to Texas in Austin, Dallas, and Houston, as well as Colorado and Mexico City. Uh, Marshall Doak, who we have today, is part of that combination, and it's a pleasure to um, have him join us. While I specialize in government contracts law, Foley offers a wide array of legal services from corporate, intellectual property, mergers and acquisitions, uh, health care, employment law. Uh, oftentimes a client will come to me with some esoteric question and I send out a firm-wide email and it is amazing how someone's like, I just addressed that last week. Uh, so we really run the gamut in terms of servicing all of our clients' needs. Uh, some of my other colleagues from Foley are joining us here today, and I will introduce them uh, towards the end, but uh, please, if you see them, introduce yourself. Are there any questions before we get started? Okay, we will now start. So as a reminder, please silence your cell phones. And I now introduce Chanley Howell, who will be talking to you today about cybersecurity. Good morning, everyone. As Aaron said, my name is Chanley Howell. I'm in our Jacksonville, Florida office and pleased to be up here. Uh, my practice is uh, nationwide, and I have been practicing technology law for uh, 30 years and a, a bit more than half of that with a heavy diet of data security and cybersecurity. So my goal today is to spend about 30 or 40 minutes uh, talking to you about recent trends and developments and best practices 
in cybersecurity. We all know it's a very hot topic. You probably read about it. You may be very involved in it. You may be only tangentially involved. But my goal is to provide you with some new and useful information because our, uh, what we like to do is keep our clients up to date. Uh, cybersecurity is constantly evolving, and it's one of the themes I'll be talking about this morning. Uh, so it's very important. You can't learn it um, on one day and then think you know it for the next two years. It's a matter of constantly keeping up. Uh, whether you're in the IT security field, you'll be having to keep up daily. Whether you're in senior leadership, uh, you'll need to keep up, maybe not as much as the IT security engineer, but you need to. It's becoming very, very clear that there is an obligation on senior management, on boards of directors, on the entire organization to have an active role in cybersecurity. And we've seen time and time again when companies do not do that, that's when bad things happen in private lawsuits, in government investigations, and in enforcement proceedings. It's no longer... Uh, just the province and domain of the IT department, it's now the entire organization, really from the top down, boards are expected to be actively involved. So um, I think it's a topic, no matter where you fit in the organization, it's important to, to know these things and, and as I say, keep up, to, keep up to date as much as possible. Uh, first, let's talk about some recent statistics and what we've been seeing in recent developments as far as cybersecurity breaches go. If you look at the boxes on the left side, you probably see these types of statistics fairly often. They simply point out the magnitude, the significant magnitude that's been increasing exponentially over the last several years of the cost of cybersecurity breaches. That is why it is such an important topic. It's why uh, we'll be talking about government agency requirements being ratcheted up. Uh, it's not just in the government contracting industry. It's, it's the entire country. It's in the entire world. You've heard of the probably the European Union has a new data protection law. Uh, so it's, it's um, on everybody's radar. So then if you look, there's some interesting statistics on the right the box on the upper right, uh, these are costs and impacts. We all know that when there's a security breach, you have to bring in likely forensic engineers, consultants, attorneys, uh, sometimes communication specialists. It takes internal resources. Uh, there may be claims, uh, defense expenses uh, on litigation defense, investigation defense, et cetera, those are hard out-of-pocket costs. But look at these other uh, sources of, lost, of, of losses and, and expenses and damages, including um, downtime. I mean, we all know how bad downtime is. If you're in a manufacturing facility and the facility goes down, that, that is an extremely bad thing. So downtime happens in 46% of the incidents. Loss of revenue, again, it's not just out-of-pocket costs, but lost sales, lost revenue. And a big one is reputational damage. Uh, sometimes this is reflected in a stock price for a publicly traded company or even a, a, a private company that, that does um, sell its stock or go into the capital markets uh, to raise funds. Uh, but reputational damage uh, can occur and finally, loss of customers, that goes hand in hand with, with loss of reputation. So it's not just the out-of-pocket costs that you pay to the lawyers and the engineering consultants. Uh, then the next box down is interesting, 61%, so well over half, uh, are businesses with fewer than 1,000 employees. So it can, we know the large organizations have a pretty robust uh, data security, but that does not insulate them. Equifax, Facebook. Target. Uh, they're all very, very large organizations, you think, with very sophisticated security. They still suffer breaches, but it's the smaller organizations that get hit as well. 80% uh, of breaches leverage stolen, weak, or guessable passwords. So we'll, you'll see as we go through this information that login credentials, username and passwords, are a huge source of 
cybersecurity breaches. Um, so that's a very important area to focus on when you're combating cybersecurity. Uh, and then this blue box along the bottom is pretty interesting. Uh, it points out that the topic of cybersecurity is discussed in 80% of all board meetings. That is a very great development. That would not be the case three years or five years ago, which I'm just throwing numbers out. Probably it'd be 50% three years ago and 25% five years ago where it was discussed. However, the CIOs and the, and the ISOs or the CISOs say the senior leaders in their organization don't view cybersecurity as a strategic priority. So what that means is there's a gap between what's being discussed at the board meetings and what senior leadership view as important. Again, that's a gap that's been very important to close um, within your organization. Uh, let me talk now about some developments that we're seeing uh, within the last several months and that we see in the upcoming months. Uh, first of all, you're probably familiar with, or you may very well be familiar with, the new uh, DFARS from the Department of Defense that have to do with cybersecurity. That really ratcheted up the cybersecurity protection and safeguard in the government contracting, in particular in the defense industry. Um, we'll talk a little bit more of that in detail. So cybersecurity now is becoming uh, not just a throwaway baseline that in the contract documents you have to have cybersecurity uh, or there would be confidentiality provision but it's actually being used more and more as an evaluation criteria to either increase a score or decrease a score or deny a contract, or there's been organizations that get pointed out as going above and beyond in getting bonus points for that. So cybersecurity is not just a check the box, <clears throat> it's an actual evaluation cr criteria along with other things you do in your organization to make yourself look attractive when you are in the bidding process. Um, I've mentioned, and you're probably familiar with the, the Department of Defense, but it's going beyond just the DOD uh, as far as cybersecurity details. GSA has published, um, has published upcoming regulations. Uh, Department of Homeland Security has as well other agencies will follow. The good news is that they all pretty much track, although some go up even a bit farther than what the DOD has done. So DOD that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute and go through those baselines is a very good starting point. Uh, there's also talk about a new, a new federal acquisition regulation uh, that it would apply to all agencies that will provide more detail on cybersecurity. Uh, we expect to see more audits. Uh, so again, not just to check the box, even more than evaluation criteria, expect audits uh, from the DOD and its, its um, divisions that do the auditing, actually coming in and checking out security controls. We're seeing activity and expecting more activity in the state and local government. Uh, the state of New York, for example, has, as you may know, a um, a new cybersecurity law that applies to, to financial institutions. So it's becoming more, more and more common to get for states to get in the game. States have, for years, starting with California, had breach notification laws that you're probably familiar with. Um, there is uh, some effort and discussion in Congress, uh, in the U.S. Congress, about having a federal law that would harmonize those. Again, Probably pretty difficult to do in the current political environment, uh, but it's something that a lot in the industry would like to see because while there is a lot of overlap and similarities in the state breach notification laws, there are differences. And if you've ever suffered a security breach involving personal information uh, and dealing with multiple states, you know that you've had to look uh, or your lawyers have in-house or external at the different state, each state law to see what the notification requirements are because they can vary. And so it, it'd be nice 
to get some consistency there. Uh, we're, we'll, we're seeing more government contractors getting into the business of risk assessments. So when government contractors are obligated to increase their security, um, they will need to make assessment. And yes, you can do that internally, but even better is to have an external organization. So if your organization is involved in IT security, you're probably look at looking at providing risk assessment services to other government contractors and to, and to private contractors. Uh, and finally, we're, we're seeing that there's a shortage, not just in the U.S., but worldwide, in, in subject matter experts in this area, so security engineers. So it, when you're doing your recruiting and planning for the future uh, to deal with your cybersecurity requirements, uh, you're going to have to make a special effort to do some good hiring and to do some good searching because, you know, as we know, employment um, is high right now. Unemployment is very low, and it's particularly acute in the cybersecurity area. So I just point that out as a as a warning. Um, just to go through some recent incidents of what some of the bigger occurrences have been. Uh, in 2017 and discovered it early this year, uh, Russia, you may have heard, hacked into uh, the utility grid. Now, they did not do any widespread damaging, damage, but the government and the security agencies could tell that Russian um, cybersecurity hackers were present in the utility grid and could have caused quite a bit of disruption. They think it was basically to see what type of security there was, could they get in if need be in the event of a war, um, or if they did need to conduct some type of cyber warfare or cyber terrorism, they wanted to know if they could do it, and they could. Uh, fortunately, the, the exposure was identified, and uh, we believe those holes have been filled, but it points out that uh, not just Russia, but state actors are getting more and more active in this area uh, and quite a risk to, to the government and to government contractors. Uh, Iran hacked into over 300 universities around the world, 144 in the United States. Also, that included into the UN, the Federal Energy Regulation Committee, and the states of Hawaii and Indiana, a law firm, a name, not fully in Lardner, uh, banks and, um, and healthcare institutions. Uh, it, the assessment was, it was not for financial um, information in the nature of credit card information or bank account, but it was $3 billion worth of IP. So we're seeing a lot more, particularly in the public sector government, that they're not looking for personal information to lead to financial fraud, although that's still on the radar. They're looking for government secrets, state secrets, company secrets, uh, espionage. Uh, but $3 billion worth of IP is quite a bit. The way it happened was spear phishing, uh, which you may know about. Spear you've heard of phishing is the fake email. Spear phishing is where the hacker has more detailed information about an individual and can be very targeted. It may come from social media, um, but the, the phishing emails are extremely targeted and very sophisticated. And out of the 100,000, it was mainly targeting professors and other staff and, and universities. Out of 100,000, 8,000 accounts were compromised. So that's some 8%, which is a pretty high percentage. Um, under Armour had a, uh, a breach of its My Fitness Pal app. Uh, the interesting thing there is it did have pretty good security and encryption. The problem was it was using old, out-of-date encryption, out encryption. So the lesson there is you can't just set it and forget it. As I mentioned, it's constantly evolving. Your IT folks have to keep up. Uh, phishing, as I mentioned, is a big, big culprit. We've been seeing lots of clients that are getting um, 
tricked with phishing emails that result in compromise of their email accounts, which then results in emails about sending, changing wire instructions for payment, uh, about wiring or about emailing out W-2 information. Uh, it's becoming very common. In fact, in, um, Verizon does an annual data security report, cybersecurity report, which is very useful. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you look it up. Uh, but uh, what they call social, uh, social breach, which is the phishing, uh, went from the sixth most common in 2010 to the third most common in 2017. So there was hacking where an, in, uh, a, an outsider is able to hack into a system. There's malware where the, the bad software gets put onto a system, social, and then errors, uh, employee error, uh, physical, which is stealing a laptop, for example, and then misuse. Now in the government sector, phishing was the number one cause of, of incidents. So when you are planning your training and awareness, uh, I urge you to focus very heavily on the phishing. And there's ways, there are consultants who can send phishing. Your organizations may have done this, send fake phishing emails out and see who all clicked on them. And then they can have training and um, hopefully learn from their mistakes. On average, uh, when these consultants conduct these phishing training exercises, 4% of the recipients will click on a link or an email that they shouldn't. All right, let's get into a little bit of um, the legal requirements and, and the changes we've been seeing uh, that would apply to, to contractors when it comes to cybersecurity. So the basic FAR is 52.20421. The very general, you have to safeguard covered contractor information systems. Uh, a, a big new standard which everyone's hearing about and using is the NIST uh, Special Publication 800-171. That's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They develop the standards for government agencies and by flow down to government contractors, and by extension, private organizations are using the NIST standards as well. So very important as far as a cybersecurity program. As I mentioned before, we're seeing it's agency by agency action. It's all uh, somewhat similar. Uh, the effort led by the DOD. But, um, We'll need to check with the different agencies and keep up with the different agencies' requirements about the specific cybersecurity activity. Uh, and the big one for the DOD, the new DFARS clause is 252.204.7012, the safeguarding covered defense information and cyber incident. Uh, and keep in mind that lack of compliance, obviously, can result in severe consequences. It can result in withholding of payments. It can result in a stop or suspension of work order. It can result in termination of the contract and even get a contractor placed on an ineligible list. So it's not something to take lightly. Here's a little more information about the DFARS and the CDI. First of all, what information does it apply to? It applies to covered defense information. And so I have here the definition of covered defense information. Um, as you may know, the, the, uh, it's unclassified controlled technical information or other information that's on the controlled unclassified information registry. Uh, so CUI is a term you may be familiar with. There's a registry that has different types of CUI. Uh, it's pretty broad, it's a pretty general list. It, it came about uh, years ago when the government tried to, to reduce the number of different data classifications. Um, but there is a registry you can look at, for example, uh, for examples, but it's this information and 
Uh, there's a couple other re uh, requirements in the alter alternative. So it, and there's one or two is an or, I'll, I'll need to add an or here, but it could be either marked or identified in a contract or other contract documents as needing special protection, or, and this is a very broad category, collected, developed, et cetera, on behalf of the con by or on behalf of the contractor in support of the performance of the contract. Very, 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 very broad. So it's almost by default. If you have any, any type of sensitive information at all that you're dealing with from the government, this is going to apply uh, under the DFARS. Uh, one point to note, though, in that the, there is guidance that in the, for what is meant by in support of the performance of a contract, it's not meant to include purely internal documents uh, like human resource or financial information that's incidental to the contract performance. Uh, additional requirements of the DFARS uh, requires adequate security, and then it provides a number of items about, well, what is adequate security? And that's where this DFARS goes further than in the past and, and further than a lot of federal laws and state data security laws. There's lots of laws on the books that talk about adequate physical, technical, and administrative safeguards, and it's left organizations with a big question mark of what does that mean? Um, by incorporating in these standards, particularly the NIST 800-171, uh, the government goes a long way in providing specific standards, and these standards are updated routinely by, by NIST. Um, a word about cloud computing services. Cloud, as you know, is becoming very, very prevalent uh, to use a third party to host data and software in support of an organization. So software and data can be located on premises, on your own servers, in your own facility, or in your own data center, and or it can be located with a third party. And with high-speed connectivity now, it's virtually seamless. Um, so it's becoming very, very common. It's a very prevalent way of doing business now. It's resulted in software solutions and data storage solutions being much more affordable uh, because the, the hosting providers and the cloud providers can do it on a wide scale. Uh, I just cite for your reference here a couple of standards. The 252.239 applies if it's a cloud provider that's dealing directly with the government and government information. So uh, holding data on behalf of the government, essentially directly from the government. Um, more often, for people in this room, you will be outsourcing your cloud services or cloud storage to a third party. Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, IBM's platform, Rackspace, many, many, many others and many smaller ones. In that case, um, then it's, it's looking to the FedRAMP moderate baseline for cloud security. So I point these out, again, not to go into detail, but either for you or for your, your security team to be aware of that if you are doing cloud computing, uh, you need to do the due diligence and the contractual requirements to be sure your cloud provider is complying with these obligations because the government or the, the, the entity you're contracting with will be looking to you for that compliance. Uh, the granddaddy, if you will, is the NIST 800-171. That's the baseline, that's the core for the adequate security under the DFARS. Uh, it's, it's a pretty detailed document. You may be, if you're in the security field, be familiar with NIST 853. Uh, that is relevant. Uh, that's an extremely detailed and difficult um, document to deal with unless you are a pretty much a full-time security consultant. 800-171 is much shorter, much more manageable. Um, sort of distills the key points from 800-53. 
The DFARS also requires other measures when contractor determines that additional measures may be required. A uh, little bit of a, a potential mine, minefield there, uh, which the government um, does on occasion that you can't just rely on the stated standards. If there's something else that's required, you're going to have to do that as well. Uh, sort of you know it when you see it. But point being, it's important to be to cover all the gaps. There can be a request to vary the requirements submitted to the contracting officer. The argument being either it's not applicable, a particular control is not applicable, or that the contractor has a control that's equally effective. Uh, then the contracting officer will take a look at that and determine whether that's the case. And the DFARS also has a new cyber incident reporting obligation. Um, here are the cyber incident reporting requirements. So a cyber incident is, and forgive me for reading, but it's worth going through this definition. Actions taken through the use of computer networks that results in a compromise or an actual or potentially adverse effect. So to repeat, potentially adverse effect, whenever you see potentially, that broadens the scope uh, on an information system and or the information residing therein. So very broad. Now the state breach notification laws are particularly tri uh, typically triggered when there's actually a breach and access or use of information. This is broader than that, uh, potentially adverse effect. If something like that happens, the contractor is obligated to conduct a review to see if there is evidence of compromise of CDI, defense information. Uh, and if there is the incident, or regardless, the incident must be reported at the DibNet site. Uh, also, if in the course of the investigation, malicious software is determined, so software that gets downloaded that can result in either shutting a system down, locking data up in a ransomware attack, or exfiltrating, taking out data. That malicious software must be isolated um, and submitted to the DOD Cybercrime Center. This is simply a screenshot of the web page that you would go to. It's, you know, as most things these days, Reporting is done electronically, uh, so there's a way to report. You have to have appropriate access to the DibNet, um, and if you do, you can report the incident uh, through the website. The uh, DOD and or contracting agency uh, can request that there be additional media, so a server or a hard drive be submitted, uh, and other additional information to the DOD. This could be uh, policies and procedures. We'll talk about system security plans in a minute. Uh, so there can be requests for additional information. Uh, and DOD can conduct a cyber incident damage assessment, so it can come in and take a look. So audits that I mentioned earlier, they could be proactive. Uh, or certainly if there's been a significant breach, I think you can expect some type of uh, on-site visit to check out your systems. So all the more important to make sure things are in good order. Um, let's talk about subcontractor sub flowdowns. Uh, this is an important aspect, particularly in today's world where vendors are becoming more and more uh, connected, not just vendors, but business partners. Um, everybody is getting connected these days. You know, the, the, the target breach that happened, it's probably been four or five years ago, you may know, that occurred when uh, through an HVAC contractor that had a connection into the target network for dealing with uh, receivables and payables. Uh, targets 
security was good. The HVAC contractor's security was bad. So the bad guys got into the HVAC um, contractor, and once they're there, it's an open gate into Target. Uh, and there's been other incidents like that as well. So that's why the flow down requirements and subcontractor security are so important. When is it required where these cybersecurity obligations must be flowed down in the contract? Required when the performance will involve operational, operationally critical support or controlled defense information. Um, again, pretty broad. And it's up to the contractor to determine if the information is required for subcontractor performance uh, and if it retains its identity as CDI. If for some reason it's de-identified or it's sanitized before it's sent, then, then it may not be required. So the DOD's em emphasis here is on the deliberate management of information requiring protection. And so it now requires a conscious effort not just to be thinking about your cybersecurity controls and safeguards, but also what information are you handling? And what are you giving and passing on to subcontractors? And is that required? One of the requirements is that contractors should minimize the flow down of information requiring protection, so it should be on a need-to-know basis only. If, yes, it's easier many times to simply send information in big bulk um, rather than being discriminate about what is sent, but that increases the risk, and if there ends up being a breach, uh, it could make things worse for the contractors. So, Think carefully about what information you do share with subcontractors and is it really, really needed by the subcontractor. Uh, here now we'll talk about some steps for implementing NIST 800-171. The, like I say, this is the foundation for the cybersecurity, it's a very useful document. Uh, what it is, is it's a list of 109 controls and it's organized into 14 families. And the families are different categories of controls, for example, and I won't go through all of them. Um, access control, uh, maybe I will just tick them off, I won't go into detail on them. Uh, and if you have any question on any of these, you know, feel free to ask during the question, uh, question session. But the 14 categories are access control, awareness and training, audit and accountability, configuration management, identification and authentication, incident response, maintenance, media protection, personnel security, physical protection, risk assessment, security assessment, system and communications protection, and system and information integrity. Um, I can send you that list later, and it's in this, actually, I would just say, look at NIST 800-171. I just wanted to give you an idea of the different categories um, of what's covered in, the, in NIST 171. And so what you should do for implementing um, NIST, does a, the publication does a good job of describing how these get implemented. Sometimes it might be a policy or process requirement, simply changing a policy in the way people do things. It might be policy or process that requires an IT implementation or configuration uh, or specific software. It could be just an IT configuration, which will be done by the IT folks. Uh, and in some instances, depending on the complexity of the organization and the sensitivity of the data, of the, uh, data it may even require the acquisition of additional software or hardware. So that's sort of a checklist when you're going through the NIST 800-171 controls, there should be a determination of how do we implement this and which one of these categories uh, is impacted. Um, a system security plan is Required, uh, this is a one-page 
excerpt, little, maybe a little hard to read in the back of the room. Um, this is something that I can send. I didn't want to print. This one's a pretty long document because uh, it goes down through each of the 100 plus controls. Uh, but it'll give you an idea of how to develop a, a system security plan. Um, so it basically, so access control is one of the families. 3.1.1 is a control. And you either uh, say that it's implemented, plan to be implemented or not applicable. If it's not applicable, you need to explain why. So you do that through all the controls, and there's your system security plan. You've identified any gaps um, with your compliance with NIST 800-171. The other document that goes hand in hand of this is a plan of action and milestones. Um, so this is an example. Again, I can be glad to send you this uh, template, but it can be used to develop a plan of action. Uh, it basically identifies the weakness, the resource or the uh, responsible office, the resource estimate if there's a budget amount, Schedule completion date, milestones and interim completion dates, changes to the milestone, how the weakness was identified, and the status. So this is a good format for developing a plan of action. Again, a document required and a document that can be requested by the government and the contracting agency in assessing your compliance with the cybersecurity. Um, take note that the DOD does not certify that a contractor is compliant. It's the contractor's obligation to determine it's in compliance. Uh, and the same with third-party assessments or certifications. Now, you may hire a third party to come in and assess your security, and they may give you a report that says you have certain things you need to do or that you meet a certain baseline, um, and that's useful information, but it's not something that you uh, necessarily submit to the government with a proposal. If it comes up in conversation or uh, back and forth with the government on your compliance and readiness, it can be relevant, uh, but there's not a 800-171 official certification. Um, a useful document is um, guidance that, that NIST came out recently, or excuse me, the DOD came out recently Four items in 800-171 that were not yet implemented. It was supposed to be, the deadline was the end of December of last year. Uh, and when it was coming up on the deadline, obviously, um, you know, we talked to a bunch of clients. It was very obvious in the industry that, uh, yes, there was advance notice, but it takes time and um, not everyone was compliant. Also, complying with these requirements, it's not an on-off switch in most cases. It's a spectrum of how strong you meet a certain control. So there is some subjectivity. But the DOD acknowledged, well, you don't have to check the box and answer 100% for each of the controls. But you do have to have a system security plan and a plan of action on how you intend to meet these compliance. That way, if the government's interested in determining, it can see, okay, uh, here's the contract we're dealing with, here's the control, uh, unclassified controlled information, or uncontrolled information we're dealing with, and um, given this SSP and the plan of action, uh, are we comfortable with this contractor or not? So that um, although the longer you go without being with having some significant gaps will be problematic. Uh, it's not the end of the world if there are things still in process. And again, security is a continual can, can continuous improvement exercise uh, in any event. So that guidance is useful. There's a link to it in the, um, in the materials uh, that can help you. Uh, this is an example, hard to read, but on, well, you can see it on your printed copy, on how to use the prioritization and implementing items that are not yet implemented. Um, it's basically a prioritization. The DOD places a value on each of the controls, and in the last column, you have notes on how to implement it. Is it an IT configuration? Um, or you can see here, 
Uh, there's one that requires hardware and uh, one that requires software. So that's a useful tool for uh, implementing 800 items that have not been fully implemented yet. Uh, and just to round out and close things out, I have references here, you know, and we can send this to you electronically to make it easier for the links, uh, but various resources. DOD has some FAQs. The NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership has some good materials. Uh, PTAP has materials, cybersecurity evaluation tool, cloud computing security requirements guide if you're doing cloud computing. Uh, all of these are very good materials that your team can use to achieve compliance. I believe, yep, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chanley. As you could tell, he's really knowledgeable and he helps you understand it in layman's terms because um, it can get very confusing, especially the FAR, the DFAR clause, as many times as I read it, uh, it's hard to understand it until Chanley explains it to me. Uh, next, we have Marshall Doak, who will be talking today about changes in government contracts, both express and constructive changes. Well, good morning. When I was invited to come here today, I engaged in a very major legal research of changes called Google. Uh, there's a lot of discussion regarding uh, agreement of changes, one party or two parties to a, a contract can make changes to the contract, but there's not a lot of information about one person, one person unilaterally making a change to a contract. Uh, where do we, in government contracts, uh, where do we get the right? Where does the government get the right to make a change to the contract? Contractors can't make a change to the contract, government contract. So where does the government get the right to do it? Unilaterally. Constitution, statute, Administration, regulation. This goes back to a musket contract in 1818. That's where a change was made to a government contract. And the concept there was that it's the sovereign, the government is the sovereign, and so the sovereign had the right to make a change. But we're, well, uh, we're past that now. Uh, virtually all government contracts uh, have a standard contract clause which expressly authorizes the government's uh, ability to make changes. The standard contract uh, changes clause for fixed price supply contracts is in a Federal Acquisition Regulation 52.243-1. Um, but there is no contract clause that contractors can make unilateral changes. What can be changed by the government? Well, changes within the general scope of the contract can be made in drawings and designs and specifications when the supplies are to be specially manufactured for the government. Um, and they're to be specially manufactured uh, of shipment and places of delivery. Now, the general scope of the contract it has to be within the general scope of the contract. Basically, if you have a one uh, uh, level, uh, on one level uh, post office, you can't get a change order and make it a 10, 10 story one because it has to be within the general scope of the contract. Now, a change that is beyond the scope of the contract is called a cardinal change. And a cardinal change is just one that uh, you don't have to accept if it's beyond the scope of the contract. 
Now, the changes clause also provides for an equitable adjustment in the contract price if the change is an increase or decrease in the cost of or the time required for performance of the contract. And failure to any agree on this uh, uh, has to be resolved by the disputes clause. How do you make a change in government contracts? Well, changes in government contracts can be bilateral, meaning two parties are unilateral with one party. A bilateral change is where the contractor and the government agree in advance on what is to be changed and the contract price adjustment, if any. The unilateral is where a change order is made by the government. It's not a change proposal, it's a change order that the government issues. Both types of changes, unilateral and bilateral, are called modifications to the contract, and uh, the government will call them Mod 1, Mod 2, Mod 25, whatever. That means modifications, how many? And it's usually marked uh, and issued by Standard Form 30. And you can Google Standard Form 30 and uh, see it easily. And Item 14 of Standard Form 30 is a description of the modification of a change. And in the little bitty print down at the bottom of item 14, it says that except as written above in that section, everything else remains changed. Now, what if item 14 doesn't state a price increase? It may take months or even years to get a price adjustment. This results in the contractors financing the performance uh, that is required by the change. Contractors, when you receive a mod on standard form 30 and you see the little section in item 14, uh, it says if you sign it, then it says that if it's not in there, it's the contract remains unchanged. So it means you have agreed, if you sign it, you have agreed that there'll be no increase in price. So if you get one of those and you, you uh, has no price increase and you think you're entitled to one, then when you receive one, you should say uh, acknowledge receipt only. Now, one reason people don't appreciate the power of the changes clause is because they don't understand the duty to proceed with the performance of the change. Contractors can't question or negotiate the technical aspects of the change. Contractors cannot insist on a price increase or a scheduling extension before beginning to perform. If the contractor uh, and the government uh, disagree on the cost, then that's resolved by the disputes clause of the contract. Now, there's no time limit on the government's obligation to make an equitable adjustment to the price. The government can't pay any part of the cost of the change until the contract price is modified. It's got, got to be a change in the contract itself before they can be paid. And of course, the government can't modify it unless they've got an appropriation, and sometimes that's a problem because you have to go back and get an additional uh, appropriation funds. It can take months or even years for the government to adjust the contract price. The contractor has the burden to prove the amount of the increased cost, burden of proof. Many smaller contractors don't have sophisticated cost accounting systems to accumulate the cost of changes separately in order to be able to prove the amount of the increased cost. Cost accounting uh, is completely different from financial accounting. Many CPA firms have little expertise in cost accounting. The big firms, if they have cost accounting expertise, it's usually in Washington. It's not in San Francisco or Dallas or Chicago or so forth. Well, how do you define a work order just for a change? How do you separate the cost of a change to a wiring harness? You got 30 or 40 little wires there and you're just gonna change two of them. How do you instruct your workers to change their time on their time card to the change and not to the basic work order? The accumulation of cost 
is even more complicated by the fact that the federal acquisition regulation has cost principles in Part 31. Uh, some costs are allowable, some costs are unallowable, and some are partially allowable. And there are about 50 different types of costs that are covered in Part 31 of FAR. And we come to constructive changes. What's the meaning of constructive? Uh, the law has long used the word constructive to mean the result of an inference or an implication by operation of all. Constructive notice. If you nail a notice on the courthouse door, that's constructive notice. You may not have read it, but you're deemed to have read it because you have constructive notice. A constructive receipt of a document. If your office gets a letter, uh, you may not see it, but you have constructive notice of the contents of that letter. In government contracts, constructive change order, the law will provide the relief which would be appropriate if a change order should have been issued. An early case said that when a change order should have been issued, the boards and courts must treat as done what should have been done. I'll now cover some examples of constructive changes. Not direct changes, but constructive changes. One is contract interpretation. That's the oldest form of constructive change is, uh, is uh, interpretation. I'm going to quote a early Armed Services Board case. Quote, perhaps the most common type of appeal to the board is where the contractor has been directed by the government to proceed with the performance of the contract in accordance with the government's interpretation of the contract. And there's a dispute as to whether the government's interpretation was correct or whether it involved work beyond the contract requirements. The standard changes and dispute clauses provide a procedure under which the government is giving the contractual right to require the contractor to proceed with performance with the government's direction and the contractor is granted an administrative remedy for resolving the dispute uh, when it's established that the government's directions involve work beyond the contract requirements. We often forget the importance of communicating uh, clearly. There's an old story in the military of the <clears throat> new soldier that just got out of boot camp and he was assigned to guard duty one night. And along about midnight, car drives up and the soldier said, Halt, uh, who goes there and he says, the driver leaned out and he says, this is commanding general. We've gone a, been gone a week and uh, opened the gate. And he said, what's the password? And the driver said, uh, he doesn't know the password, he's been gone. Uh, and so the soldier goes over to the driver's window and he leans in and looks back at the general in the back seat and he said, General, I'm new at this, who do I shoot first, you or the driver? <laughs> well, some language is intentionally ambiguous. There's an old story, an old song, you remember, if... if uh, if I said you had a beautiful body, would you hold it against me? Uh, that's intentionally ambiguous. Some language is ambiguous uh, until it is pointed out to you. For example, all of you have been in a hotel room in the bathroom and it says, please place curtain and tub before showering. Now, just think a minute how long it'd take you to get all those little rings at the top if you did exactly what it said to put it in the tub. One of the biggest areas of constructive changes is the uh, defective specification. There are two basic types of specification. First type is design. That means build a print. The government gives you the uh, specifications and drawings and say, just do what the specs and drawings say, and if you do it, you'll get an acceptable result. The other is the performance type. It doesn't tell you how to do something. It just tells you this is what has to be done. 
A classic example, some of you may not remember this, but the famous man who put out the fires of the uh, oil field, Red Adair, Adair uh, his contract had one, three words of specification, put it out. That's a performance specification. The government, and this is something that some people don't understand, and it, it's sad because it's a very important point. The government guarantees or warrants that the specification and the drawings they give you uh, uh, are accurate. In other words, uh, contractors are entitled to rely on the government's contract documents. The government guarantees that if the contractor follows the specifications and drawings, a satisfactory uh, product will result. Now, the government's warranty or guarantee means that the contractors are entitled to assume that the parts manufactured in accordance with the specifications will work even at the extremes of tolerances. Uh, think about that in a minute. Do you have a famous case of a machine gun, and they had a stock and a receiver and a barrel, and if the, each one uh, was at the extreme of tolerance on the high side. Uh, if it didn't, if it uh, didn't comply with the overall dimension, then it's defective because the item should be able to operate even at the extremes of uh, tolerance. Um, this rule of tolerances that something has to work. Uh, even at the extremes of tolerance, has even been applied to electrical tolerances. It gets complicated to compute those tolerances in electrical uh, uh, units, but uh, it still uh, works. One major area of constructive changes involves the government's imposing limitations on the contractor's method or manner of performance. Where the government Fails to specify standards for a required item. A contractor is entitled to utilize the, destruct, the uh, discretion to perform the manner in the least costly and matter which will be so that will satisfy both the uh, functional and aesthetic requirements of the contract. Um, one example of that is the contract. It was a uh, painting contract, and it didn't prohibit rolling or spraying paint. And when the government said, well, uh, you have to do it by rolling, that was a constructive change because the government, the contractor had the right to use rolling, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to use spraying because it didn't say otherwise in the contract. Superior knowledge, another constructive change. When a contractor is not advised of information that uh, is exclusively available to the uh, government, uh, and if the contractor is misled uh, in submitting its price, that may be a breach of contract. The government is not liable if the contractor has or should have uh, the information available to it. Inspection and testing is another area of constructive changes. The government's insistence on standards in excess of the Contract requirements entitles a contractor to an equitable adjustment. Even the government's discretion to change the method of testing can be a constructive change. Overzealous government representations and representatives that are unreasonably strict standards have been uh, found to be constructive changes. Strict inspection is not necessarily a constructive change. The government has the right to require strict performance of the drawings and specifications. Even if it's not necessary, the government can require, demand, strict compliance with the drawings and specifications. Another area of constructive changes is interference with performance. Every contract has a upon each party a duty of good faith and fair dealing. One result of this implied obligation is that the government may be liable for hindering performance of a government contract. 
In one case, the contractor alleged government interference by over-inspection and harassment by the government's engineer who sometimes used harsh and vulgar language. The Board of Contract Appeals said, however, that if harsh and vulgar words are sometimes a constructive contract breach, no building would be constructed in our lifetime because the parties would be too busy litigating breach claims. Failure to cooperate is another area of constructive change. The government may have a duty to take affirmative action to assist the contractor. Many government technical people and contract administrators don't understand that they have a duty to do that, to assist the contractor when they can. Even the government's mere silence may be deemed a failure to cooperate. It may be a constructive change if the government fails to respond to a contractor's request for information. Acceleration is another constructive change area. If the government refuses to extend the, the uh, schedule when there has been a uh, excusable delay, that can be uh, acceleration. In order to recover their increased cost of acceleration, but the delays must be excusable. Contract administration, the government's actions or its failure to act or its failure to act in a timely manner may be unreasonable and result in a constructive change. There's one clear area that is not uh, litigated often, but it's true that if the government uh, delays in uh, providing approvals of documents and plans and schedules, uh, that can be a constructive change. Now we'll cover a little on equitable adjustments. If the government's policy is, is uh, to change orders uh, prospectively in issue, that's the policy of the government. Now the meaning of equitable adjustment becomes the trade usage in government contracts. As used in the uh, changes clause, equitable adjustment means a correction of the contract price that will keep the contractor whole. The equitable part of the adjustment means the difference caused by the change. Allowable cost. The subject of allowable cost is unique in public contracting. There is no comparable limitation uh, in the law of damages in commercial contracting. The federal cost, cost principles in FAR Part 31 uh, must be used in pricing changes and other contract modification. Now I'm going to mention something that may be worth your whole day here, and that's claims. There's a request for an equitable adjustment that you can make, or you can submit a claim under the Contract Disputes Act. When you submit a claim, it can be on estimates. You don't have to have already incurred the cost. You can, if you get a change order, and it's, you estimate be $200,000 to complete it, you can submit a claim immediately based on that estimate. And the government pays interest on the amount of that claim that you have made. That's the only time I know that you can get interest on costs that you haven't incurred. But you, but you can do that with claims, and that just tells us as contractors that you should put an estimate in as soon as you can, uh, and you, you can't cheat, but you can be generous in your estimate of what it's going to cost, and you get an interest on that, and it starts from the day you submit that claim. Um, most government contractors have a cost accounting system in addition to financial accounting, but uh, Except in major contract modification, uh, work orders normally are not established to accumulate different costs. The cost of changes um, more frequently are estimated based on other cost items or experience. Government auditors may choke on the phrase estimated actual cost. 
estimated actual cost. But I use that in litigation because I want the judge to know that you have already incurred the cost, you just didn't accumulate them, and that's, it's estimated. And if you do that every time, now the auditors just go bananas when you say estimated actual cost. But the fact is that uh, if you have incurred the cost, you may not have had a, a work order for it, but you can estimate that, and you have incurred that cost. And I always do that in litigation because I want that judge to know that we have paid, uh, we have incurred that cost, and we're not just estimating of what it's going to be in the future. There are several types of approaches to prove cost. The actual cost accumulated, total cost method, which is non-favored, modified total cost, jury verdict method. These are methods of proof, but the, uh, all of them, uh, some are frowned on. Uh, of course, the, the uh, favored one is actual cost accumulated. But many times you have a constructive change and you don't know that it's going to cost you a lot more money. And maybe three or four months down the line that you see that this is costing me money and I need to get money from the government. So these are changes that I think are important to you. The main thing is if you know that when you submit a claim you get interest beginning immediately, that will save you a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Um, and I would just add to that that um, in addition to getting interest once you submit your claim, in the request for equitable adjustment stage, the REA stage, you can recover your legal fees and accounting fees that you incur in preparing the REA as part of that REA. So then when you then convert the REA to a claim, if you can't resolve it at the REA stage, your attorney's fees and accounting fees that you incur to put together your justification become part of that claim. So my pitch to you is if you have a change, get us involved early at the REA phase because then we can help you develop it factually and legally, and then those costs will become part of the claim as opposed to um, once you come to us with the claim at that stage, then uh, your legal fees aren't covered, although you do get the interest. So we are going to quickly, for those on the phone, um, announce the first CLE code. So those in the room, stand by. Uh, the first code is X, 1, C is in cat, E is in Edgar, U is in umpire. That is X, 1, C, E, U. One more time. X, 1, C, E, U. With that, we will now take some questions. So if Chanley and Marshall want to come back up here, there's a microphone up there. Um, are there any questions in the room for Chanley or Marshall? I think I chilled it by uh, stating that it was being recorded, huh? The question is, is whether the DFAR cybersecurity clause is a flow down to commercial item contractors as well? And the answer to that is yes, it is. I'll answer for you. Yes. Is that with the request for equitable? Correct. That's only at the REA stage. Once you convert it to a claim, you may not get your legal fees covered. That's correct. Well, I don't think that's, is that on? Trying to uh, prepare the amount that you're asking for, make sure you identify it uh, as a, a equitable adjustment you're asking for, contract administration. Because if you say claim, it's unallowable. So you don't want that in your records that you're preparing a claim. You're, what you're doing is asking uh, for an amendment to the contract uh, from an equitable adjustment standpoint. And the reason why that is is because an REA is seen as contract administration, 
as opposed to you typically convert it to a claim once there's been an impasse between the parties. That's typically what triggers it. And that becomes more, as Marshall said, in the disputes mode. And that's why uh, at that point your legal fees are no longer recoverable. Yes. The question is if a uh, breach doesn't actually result in access to CDI, whether or not it still needs to be reported to the government. Um, we view those as sort of on a sliding scale about how significant the incident is. Certainly if there's no CDI accessed, um, well, if there is CDI accessed, obviously you would need to. Um, we have advised clients, so if it's a significant security hole that the government would definitely be interested in knowing about to err on the side because the, the description of an incident is very broad. Uh, and you wouldn't want to be on the side of not disclosing something that should have been disclosed and then it later comes up as an issue which if it had been disclosed earlier it could have been remedied. So it's, it's a little bit of a sliding scale depending on the nature of the uh, severity of the incident and the data involved. And I think that goes with a lot in government contracting, as what Chanley said. I mean, my kind of rule of thumb is if you do disclose it to the government and it's a non-issue to them, no harm, no foul. If you think it's going to be a non-issue to the government and therefore you don't disclose it, but they actually do find out about it and think it's an issue, you're going to be in trouble. So I think uh, the best thing is to always be open with the government and honest because that's where you avoid any of the False Claims Act, false statement, any of those issues, if you're disclosing it to the government. And the government appreciates that. Really what all of this is, including the disclosures, is the government wants you to police yourself. They don't want to have to go out there and do it, so it's showing them that you're a responsible contractor. Yes. There uh, was a question saying right now the cybersecurity requirements don't come with a certification like ISO and whether or not there's any movement towards that. I have not seen any. Um, I think it's on, the burden is on the contractor to comply and uh, I, I don't see it, I haven't heard and I don't see it going the way of like an ISO certification. Keep in mind in your SAM registration, your System for Award Management registration, there are certifications relating to your compliance with these clauses. Go ahead. So the question is, if a prime contractor asks for your SSP and POM, right, did I get that right? <laughs> um, it, does the subcontractor have to provide it, and should the subcontractor provide it? Uh, I may need to check on that. My understanding is that, and I think I recall that it could be done with some redaction if it's particularly sensitive. Um, but to be honest, I wouldn't do it without further checking, and I haven't had that specific issue come up, and it's pretty critical, so um, I would want to check that out before you had to, but I think it, um, if it's going to be done, it would be done in, in a redacted format if there's any sensitive, particularly sensitive information. As a higher tier contractor, as a prime, I'd be surprised if they'd really want to do that because I know that there's a benefit of flowing down requirements and making your subcontractor comply without having to intimately police them. So I think that's going to give the prime some knowledge and then if there's a breach, there might be some liability on behalf of the prime for not um, identifying errors in the subcontractor's SSP. So I haven't seen those requests coming in yet, but I'm sure you probably have. <laughs> and we have some from the phone. We have two different questions. The first question is, if you harmonize IT security does that make you more vulnerable to hacking? Not sure 
if you harmonize IT security, does that make you more vulnerable to hacking? I think they meant if you harmonize your platforms across all the various channels and sync them as one, does that oh, help you? Oh, yeah. If it's getting at that, yes. Um, there's a concept of network segmentation. So I, the, the, you do need to be careful if you are interconnecting all of your different systems and networks. It's a balancing act between having a large organization uh, with multiple systems, particularly if there's acquisition of legacy companies, there may be a lot of connecting of networks, there's obviously benefits to, to connecting various systems. But when you're doing that, you also need to be cognizant of the fact that if a hacker gets into system A and there is a relatively uh, open link between system A and system B, it makes system B more vulnerable. So when doing a risk assessment and security assessment, you need to determine, well, how important is that uh, connectivity between system A and system B. Uh, and so, for example, um, in dealing with particularly sensitive information, it's a good idea to segment that data in that system, which by segmenting it might mean there has to be additional, uh, there's additional access controls in place, and it might be an additional logon with a different username and or password, which employees don't like, but sometimes it's important to do that because it can help avoid, um, if a hacker gets into one system, being, in, in, being able to infiltrate the entire organization. And actually, we'll save that next question for after the next, to the next Q&A because I want to keep us on time. So this is now time for a break. Uh, during the break, there's a bunch of materials over there on a the table. Feel free to look at them, take what you want. We're going to reconvene at 40 after, so you have a 15-minute break, and we're going to start promptly. Thank you. So now Mika Zomer from our Washington, D.C. office is going to present on You Received a Government Contract, Now What? Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, as Aaron said, my name is Mika Zomer. I'm based out of our... Uh, Boise, D.C. office um, in the government contracts practice. So uh, my presentation today will cover some of the uh, key performance requirements uh, contractors should be aware of, um, some of the periodic reporting obligations uh, under the FAR, and I'll also discuss uh, the requirements for implementing a compliance uh, and ethics program. The presentation is not going to cover, it will not cover all performance requirements or uh, reporting obligations but we'll touch on some of the more prevalent ones that uh, our clients have, have dealt with or that have caused some confusion. But uh, if you have uh, questions about any performance requirements that I do not address, uh, please feel free to come talk to me uh, at the lunch and I'll, I'll try to answer your questions. So why is uh, compliance so important? Uh, well, as you can see from this list, um, failure to comply can lead to severe penalties. Uh, for example, if you're not complying on a current contract, you can get dinged with negative ratings and CPARs, and um, those ratings can follow you around and negatively impact your ability to obtain future contracts. Uh, you can also have uh, well, termination for default is a possibility. You can also have uh, potential FCA, FCA violations. Uh, an example of when this might occur is uh, if, you, if you represent yourself as a, as a small business and uh, you receive a small business set aside and you're performing, everything's going along, and you're submitting invoices, and then later you discover, wait, uh, we, we're not actually small business, the, our certification was improper. Well, now you've submitted uh, invoices based on an improper certification, and uh, each of those invoices could be a, potentially be a false claim and uh, result in uh, penalties per invoice. Uh, and then also uh, another, uh, what I'll discuss later, suspension and debarment is another po uh, potential consequence. So um, given these uh, severe uh, consequences, it's very important that you read the contract so that you know your obligations. And, and in fact, if you're reading the contract, you're already behind the ball. You should actually read uh, the solicitation before you uh, receive award because, um, and you should make sure that you understand what your requirements will be and that you can comply with those requirements and that you're, you're pricing uh, your uh, compliance obligations into the contract.
The first thing a prospective contractor should do is register in SAM. Uh, registration is required in order to receive a government contract, and the good news is is that it is uh, yeah. The good news is it's free. Uh, as uh, part of the SAM registration, you'll have to enter uh, a number of required representations and certifications. Uh, for example, this is where you would represent your small business status, and you would also make a number of certifications regarding uh, your compliance with a number of, of requirements. As I mentioned, it's important to make sure those reps and certs are accurate uh, because improper certifications can potentially result in FCA or false statements uh, liability. Uh, also, when you register, there's an option to opt in or opt out of making your SAM profile publicly available. Uh, I'll just note that one of the benefits of making your SAM profile public is that it would allow uh, state and local buyers and um, and potential prime contractors who are looking for subcontracting or teaming opportunities, it would allow them to, to find you and see what you do. And, and uh, so your SAM profile can sort of serve as a, a marketing tool. Uh, FAR 52203 Are we back up? Okay. FAR 52023-13 requires contractors to develop a code of business ethics and conduct and to provide a copy of a code to all employees uh, working on the contract. This has to be done within 30 days of contract award. Uh, the requirement only applies to contracts over $5.5 million and that require a period of performance of more than 120 days. Note that the clause doesn't specify what has to be included in the code uh, and it, it doesn't require that a copy of the code be given to the government. Here are, uh, these are some uh, hallmarks of an effective code. Uh, it should be well written with clear language that is understood by employees at all levels of the organization. It should be tailored to your company and industry. Every company is unique and has a unique set of circumstances and risks they face, so your code should address, uh, should address the risks that are unique to your, uh, to your organization. Um, it's important to have a code that demonstrates a strong tone from the, from the top uh, and a commitment from leadership. Uh, as far as setting this tone in the code itself, you'll see most codes will have a message uh, up front from the CEO or president that uh, says, uh, you know, these are our company values uh, and, and we expect our employees to, to comport with those values. Uh, it's also important to note that an employee handbook and a code are different uh, and they should be treated separately. We've seen situations where companies will have a one-page code of conduct that they incorporate into their uh, employee handbook, uh, but that likely would not uh, pass muster under, under the requirements of the clause. Also note that unlike, a, uh, unlike an employee handbook, a code is typically made publicly available on uh, your company website. Uh, here are some just a uh, list of suggested topics that can be addressed in your code. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it includes some of the more um, government, sent, uh, government contracts uh, focused uh, topics. Your code should, uh, should address each of these topics at a fairly high level. Um, you want to make sure you're sufficiently communicating the company policy and what's expected, but you don't want to get bogged down in, in too many details. Um, some of these topics also have, uh, have um, in addition to being in the code, they have additional compliance uh, and reporting obligations, which I'll address uh, later in the, in the presentation. But um, I just wanted to give you a sense of some of these topics here. And here's a uh, list uh, of additional topics to cover. So uh, FAR 52203-13, uh, in addition to uh, requiring a code of conduct, it also requires the implementation of a business ethics awareness uh, and compliance program and an internal control system. Uh, these have to be established within 90 days of contract award. If, uh, if you're a small business or commercial item contractor, you're not required to implement these measures, but you would still face the threat of su suspension and debarment and, and other penalties. So uh, while your compliance program wouldn't have to meet uh, the requirements of the clause, we would uh, certainly encourage you to have some type of uh, compliance program in place. Um, and a business ethics awareness and compliance program requires periodic communication 
of a contractor's uh, standards and procedures through employee training. To make uh, the training effective, you should have a written training plan. Uh, you should do your training at least, at least once a year, and you should make sure it's updated to reflect uh, ch any changes in laws and regulations. Also, to make the training as meaningful as possible, you should attempt to tailor it to, uh, to an individual's job and responsibilities to the extent uh, you can. So, for example, if you have a specific group of, of employees who are working on government uh, contracts-related requirements, uh, you, should train those, you should train those employees on those specific requirements. Um, you, want to try, you just want to make sure the right people are getting the right information. Um, it's also important to keep uh, records of your trainings and to uh, obtain acknowledgments of uh, completion from employees. If your employee goes out and does something they were specifically trained not to do and the government comes asking about it, you can say, oh, here's the training, here's they, they were trained on this, here's their uh, acknowledgment, um, and um, uh, that may be a mitigating factor in any uh, penalties that may be assessed against the company. Uh, the internal control system, the goal of, of the internal control system is to facilitate uh, timely discovery of improper conduct and to ensure that appropriate measures are taken. Uh, we find that companies and employees want to do the right thing, and uh, the internal control system gives them the tools and the encouragement to do so. Um, the clause identifies uh, the, minimum the minimum requirements of an internal control system. Um, for one, responsibility for the... Uh, for uh, the compliance program should be assigned to someone uh, at a sufficiently high level of the company. Uh, this could involve appointing a, a compliance officer who has direct line, uh, has a direct line of communication with uh, officers or managers. Um, and uh, a compliance program, uh, you know, it's, it's not a paper exercise. Uh, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be stuffed in a drawer on a shelf somewhere. You need to periodically review it and make uh, any changes necessary uh, so that it remains uh, effective. Um, you also have to have some type of internal reporting mechanism. This could be a, uh, a typically a hotline, or you can have a lockbox. Um, and uh, you want to make sure that the reporting is, the reporting system allows for confidentiality and uh, anonymity. Uh, uh, and you should assure uh, employees that they will not be retaliated against for raising concerns. Now we'll cover some of the uh, specific performance requirements and reporting obligations that uh, contractors should be aware of. Um, Executive Order 11246 prohibits discrimination against uh, any employee or applicant for employment based on protected categories. Uh, these protected categories have gone through uh, changes, but uh, currently they include uh, race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and national origin. You're required to post EEO notices in conspicuous, conspicuous places uh, where they're easily uh, visible to all employees and applicants. Uh, that would be like a, a break, room, break room or a lunch room or a lobby. Uh, and uh, you're, also encourages, you're also encouraged to post notices on an internal company website. There's uh, also a reporting obligation under the FAR clause. Uh, within 30 days of contract award, you have to file an EEO-1 report uh, where you provide employment data that's categorized by race, gender, and uh, job category. And that report has to be filed uh, every year by September 30th, in addition to the uh, 30 days within contract award. Also, if you're a company with multiple facilities, you should provide a report uh, covering your headquarters and a separate report for each facility employing 50 or more uh, employees. There are also equal opportunity clauses that specifically prohibit discrimination against uh, veterans and workers with disabilities. And there's a requirement to file uh, in a uh, VETS 4212 report uh, through which you provide data on the number of veterans in your workforce. <clears throat> the uh, FAR and uh, Department of Labor regulations require that contractors with 50 or more employees and contracts of $50,000 or more uh, develop a written affirmative action program for each of its establishments. Uh, the programs have to be developed within 120 days of contract award, and uh, they have to be updated annually. The purpose of the affirmative action program uh, generally is to ensure that you're complying with your equal opportunity requirements. And uh, the requirements of what have to be included in the program are set forth at 41 CFR uh, 
Part 60-2, and there are also unique, if you're a, a construction contractor, there are unique requirements for, for your affirmative action program. Uh, you're required to keep a copy of the affirmative action program on file, and you only have to produce it uh, upon agency request. Uh, many, uh, many contracts require that you verify uh, the eligibility of your employees through the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Employment Eligibility Verification website, or E-Verify. Verification involves matching information uh, on employees' I-9 forms uh, against records available to the Social, Sec Social Security Administration and DHS. The requirements to, uh, to register and E-Verify are set forth at FAR 52.222-54. Under the clause, you're required to enroll and E-Verify within 30 days of contract award. Then within 90 days of enrollment, uh, you have to start initiating verification of all your new employees, whether or not they're assigned to the contract. Um, for employees that are assigned to the contract but who have not yet been verified, uh, you're required to verify their employment within the later of 90 days of enrollment or 30 days from when they were assigned to the contract. Some employees are accepted from this uh, verification requirement. So, for example, you don't have to, uh, uh, some employees with um, uh, security clearances or who have gone through uh, certain uh, home, Homeland Security background checks. Federal law prohibits the use of federal funds to lobby government officials in connection with the federal contract, grant, loan, or cooperative agreement, and uh, lobbying firms are required to register with Congress under the Lobbying Disclosure Act, but the FAR includes some additional disclosure requirements that apply to contractors who hire lobbyists. Uh, before award, as part of your offer, you're required to certify that you haven't used federally appropriated funds. Uh, to, to lobby a government official regarding the award of the contract. Uh, you're also required to disclose any lobbying paid with non-federal funds that did occur in connection with the contract, and those disclosures are made through an OMB form LLL. Uh, the form LLL identifies the lobbying, form, uh, the lobbying firm you used and the names of each of the individuals from the firm um, who lobbied on your behalf. After you receive a contract, uh, you have to update your disclosure to reflect any material changes to your pre-award disclosure information. So a material change uh, requiring disclosure can include a change in the firm that you used or a change uh, in persons within the current firm uh, that are lobbying on your behalf, um, or a change in the agencies or government, uh, or, uh, government officials that, uh, that are being lobbied. And those changes have to be reported within 30 days of the end of the calendar quarter in which the change occurred. Yeah, if you didn't lobby before award, but you hire a lobbyist post-award, uh, for example, to obtain uh, a contract extension, uh, you also have to file a disclosure form, and those uh, those forms have their own, um, and that has their uh, its own timing uh, timeliness requirement. Um, also, as a subcontractor, you are um, required to flow down these requirements to your lower tier subcontractors, and then a copy of disclosure forms should be forwarded from tier to tier up to the prime contractor, and then it's the prime contractor's resp responsibility to submit all the disclosure forms to the contracting officer. Trafficking in persons. Uh, the U.S. government has a zero tolerance policy on trafficking in persons, and uh, FAR 52.222-50 uh, includes a number of requirements related to this policy. Up front, I should say that um, you may think of trafficking in persons. When you think of it, you may think it's of the more severe forms of, uh, of trafficking, uh, such as forced labor or sex trafficking. But in fact, the conduct prohibited under the clause is much more broad than that. Um, for example, it's a violation if you deny an employee access to their um, identification documents, such as their passports or, or driver's licenses. So at first glance, you may think that this would never apply to you, but uh, just be aware that the clause uh, applies, uh, may apply more broadly than you think. Um, under the clause, you're required to notify employees about the government's zero tolerance policy and the actions that will be taken against them if they violate the policy, and you should address that notification in your code of conduct. Also, if you're uh, performing a contract outside the U.S. that has a value in excess of $500,000, you're required to develop a trafficking in persons compliance plan. And, um, and if... Uh, if According to the clause, if uh, one of your employees engages in prohibited conduct, um, the, the existence of an effective compliance plan can be a, uh, 
a mitigating factor in any uh, penalties assessed against the company. The Anti-Kickback Act uh, is prohibits providing or attempting to provide any kickback, soliciting, accepting, or attempting to accept any kickback, or including a kickback in the contract or subcontract price. A kickback uh, can be anything of value, uh, meals, gift certificates, uh, invitations to attend a sporting event, uh, uh, given directly or indirectly for the purpose of obtaining or rewarding um, favorable treatment. And FAR 52203-7 requires that contractors have in place and follow reasonable procedures designed to prevent and detect violations of the Act. These procedures can include um, addressing kickback. You should, you should address uh, kickbacks in your code of conduct and uh, educate employees through training. You can also uh, establish a multi-level approval requirement for procurements above a certain threshold so you don't have just one person uh, uh, approving these uh, procurements. Uh, and um, requiring em uh, employees to provide declarations regarding gifts or gratuities they've received and uh, also declarations that they are complying with the company's ethics uh, rules. Uh, although the clause does not apply to commercial item contracts, uh, commercial item contractors will still need to comply with the Anti-Kickback Act uh, under FAR 52.212-4. Uh, FAR 52.223-6 requires that within 30 days of contract award, a contractor has to publish a statement of its drug-free workplace policy and, um, and develop a drug-free uh, awareness program. And you're also required to notify employees in writing of their obligation to comply with the uh, company's policy and to notify them of any certain drug-related convictions. Uh, if an employee does notify you of a, of a drug-related conviction, then that triggers uh, a compliance obligation on the part of the contractor to notify the, uh, the contracting officer. Uh, and the company should, uh, would be required to take appropriate action against that employee, which uh, can include, would up to and including uh, termination. Uh, you should ensure that your document retention policies comply with uh, the minimum requirements of the FAR. Um, some prime contracts permit the government to audit a contract for up until three years after final payment, and um, you're required to retain and make available those records necessary for the government to perform its audit. Uh, the policies and procedures for retaining records are set forth at FAR uh, 4.7, uh, and uh, that, that part details uh, the uh, various uh, retention periods and you can see some of those uh, periods listed here for each of the uh, different types of documents. Um, also, in addition to having a policy regarding retaining records, you should have a policy regarding document destruction at the end of the retention period. Um, record destruction eliminates the cost and burden of, uh, story of storage. And also, if the government comes to perform an audit uh, or investigation after the retention period and seeks uh, records as part of that investigation, you can show them a certificate of, uh, of destruction rather than providing the records themselves. Uh, the mandatory disclosure requirement, uh, under the suspension and debarment regulations of FAR 9.4, a contractor can be suspended or debarred for a knowing failure by a principal to timely disclose credible evidence of uh, criminal violations and significant overpayments. Uh, so there are a couple things to unpack here. First, the requirement to disclose applies to principles, which is defined as an officer, director, owner, partner, or a person having primary management or supervisory responsibilities. Uh, second, the, the requirement is for timely disclosure, but there's no definition of what's timely. Um, however, the timely requirement should be read in conjunction with the, cre with the credible evidence standard, which provides that you're, you're only required to provide a disclosure if, uh, when you have cred credible evidence of a violation. Well, obtaining credible evidence often requires that you uh, conduct an investigation. So uh, in assisting our clients with mandatory disclosures, uh, we've often used a two-step uh, disclosure approach. Uh, we'll first provide an initial disclosure that flags the potential violation for the government, and then we'll uh, request additional time uh, to conduct an internal investigation and then later, uh, after we'll provide after the internal investigation, we'll we'll provide a more detailed disclosure uh, based on the results of the investigation. Uh, the objective here is you want to notify the government of violation before they find out about it themselves. Uh, there are also a number of uh, subcontracting requirements you should be aware of, and I'll touch on some of those now. 
The FAR prohibits uh, contractors from entering into subcontracts in excess of uh, $35,000 with subcontractors who have been suspended or debarred. So uh, as a prime contractor, you're required to obtain written written representations from your subcontractors as to whether at the time of subcontract award they have been, they're debarred or suspended or their principals are debarred or suspended. Um, And this requirement should be flowed down. So if you're a subcontractor, you should require your lower subcontractors to provide uh, similar written representation. Uh, As a policy, the uh, federal government seeks to provide uh, small businesses an opportunity to participate in federal government contracts. And one way the government uh, carries out that policy is to require large businesses to submit small business subcontracting plans. The requirements of what what, what has to be included in the plan are set forth in the clause, but at a very general level, the plan should include your subcontracting goals for each of the various small business categories and, uh, and how you plan on meeting those goals. Developing your plan requires identifying specific small business uh, subcontractors, and the clause allows you to rely on a contractor's small business representations in SAM uh, as an accurate representation of that contractor's small business status. Uh, Here are some requirements uh, of a small business subcontracting plan. Uh, You have to provide an assurance that uh, you'll make a good faith effort to uh, acquire the goods and services from the small business you identified uh, in preparing your proposal. Uh, And you have to provide an assurance that you'll comply with small business uh, subcontracting reporting requirements. Uh, There are two types of small business subcontracting plans. There's a uh, commercial plan and an an individual plan. A commercial plan covers your uh, entire fiscal year and applies uh, for the entire production of commercial items sold by uh, the company. And this is the preferred plan for the sale of commercial items. An individual plan covers uh, the entire contract period for a specific contract, and uh, it includes goals that are based on the contractor's plan subcontracting in support of that specific contract. The clause requires you to submit uh, reports to verify uh, the actual small business subcontracts that were awarded uh, to small businesses. And there are two types of reports, uh, individual subcontract reports. Uh, those report on, actual, on the actual subcontracts awarded to uh, small business concerns and, uh, and, uh, throughout the life of, a, of the contract. Uh, ISRs are required for uh, individual plans but are not required for commercial plans. And, uh, Summary subcontract reports, um, those are required for both individual and commercial plans, uh, and uh, SSRs uh, report on combined subcontracting data data from both plans, as well as data from federal government contracts that don't require subcontracting plans. Also, if you're contracting with the DOD, you should uh, should be aware that there are some uh, additional uh, reporting requirements in the DFARS. If you're a small business contra- uh, contractor performing a small business set-aside or uh, a contract awarded under the uh, SBA's 8A program, there are uh, some subcontracting limitations you need to be aware of. For example, uh, if you're performing a service contract, your personnel have to perform at least 50% of the cost of uh, performance. And for supply contracts, you have to perform at least 50% of the cost of manufacturing. Um, There is a potential change on the horizon to the limitations on subcontracting clause. Uh, A change in SBA regulations currently allows small business concerns to take credit for work performed by similarly similarly situated subcontractors, which are entities that have uh, the same small business program status as the prime contractor. So uh, under the SBA change, uh, work performed by uh, a similarly situated subcontractor will not count toward the subcontracting percentages under the clause. So, uh, in other words, work performed by those subcontractors will be as if uh, will be treated as if uh, it was performed by the prime contractor. Um, the SBA change has been proposed for incorporation into the FAR, but it is uh, unclear if and when uh, that uh, proposed rule will be implemented. It's sort of in flux right now. Um, it, in some circumstances, you'll be required to obtain a uh, contracting officer's written consent before entering into certain subcontracts. 
the requirement for consent depends on whether your purchasing system has been approved. Uh, an approved purchasing system is one that has gone through uh, the con uh, contractor purchasing system review, which is mandated by the FAR. If you don't have an approved purchasing system, um, you're required to obtain consent for any subcontract that is cost reimbursement, time and materials, labor hour, and uh, also unpriced actions under a fixed price contract. If you do have an approved uh, purchasing system, you still may be required to obtain consent before placing subcontracts that are specifically identified in, uh, in the prime contract as requiring consent. And if consent is required, uh, there's, uh, you have to provide the contracting officer notice uh, in advance of entering into uh, or modifying a subcontract, and uh, the clause specifies information that you have to include in, uh, in that notice. Under FAR 5204-10, uh, as a prime contractor, you're required to uh, report specific information related to your first-tier subcontracts over $30,000. Um, you have to provide executive compensation information for a first-tier subcontractor if all of these uh, criteria are met. Um, and the reporting requirements applies to the prime contractor, not the subcontractor. So if you're a subcontractor, you should only provide the information needed for the prime to satisfy its reporting obligations. Uh, the executive comp compensation information should, report, should be reported at the uh, Federal uh, Reporting Subaward System website, and uh, it should be submitted uh, at the end of the month following the month uh, of first-tier subcontract award and uh, annually thereafter. In addition to uh, reporting uh, first-tier subcontractor uh, executive uh, compensation information, prime contractors are also required to submit uh, specific information regarding your first-tier subcontracts or, uh, and subcontractors, and you can see some of the examples of that information listed here. To help guard against the uh, payment of uh, an excessive pass-through charge, you may be required to report uh, certain information if you subcontract a, a certain amount of work. Um, the government does not pay exec uh, excessive pass-through charges, which uh, would be where you charge the government for indirect costs or profits on work performed by one of your subcontractors for which you added little or no value. Prior to award, if you intend to subcontract more than 70% of the contract work, your proposal has to identify the amount of uh, indirect costs and profits that are applicable to the subcontract's work, subcontractor's work and uh, the value that you'll be adding to the subcontractor's work. Also, if you, um, if you hadn't planned on subcontracting more than 70% of the work before the contract, but during uh, contract performance, you, um, you change the amount of subcontract work so that now you are uh, subcontracting more than 70% of the work, uh, you're required to provide uh, written notification to the contracting officer of, of those changes. Finally, um, as a uh, prime contractor, you need, to make, you need to make sure you're flowing down the clauses and requirements as necessary. Uh, you certainly want to flow down the clauses uh, that you're required to flow down, but you also want to flow down the clauses um, that you need to flow down in order to comply with your uh, obligations to the government, including your, um, your reporting obligations. And if you're a subcontractor, you also uh, have to flow down the clauses that are required for you to comply with your obligations to your higher tiered contractor. So just a few key takeaways. Um, you should remember and understand your uh, contractual compliance obligations. Uh, this should be done uh, at the solicitation phase before you're awarded the contract and you should make sure that those obligations are priced into your contract. You should develop a code of uh, conduct that addresses the specific risks your company faces. Um, remember that an effective compliance program is a key to, uh, to minimizing exposure to penalties that can, can result from noncompliance, and it requires training and buy-in from the highest levels of your company. And uh, while compliance requirements are, are required for some contractors, Given that uh, all contractors can be subject to penalties for noncompliance, um, every contractor should have uh, some type of compliance program in place. So that concludes my presentation.
Okay, and now that brings us to our next uh, CLE announcement. Um, before I say that, I, I give Michal a lot of credit. He took on the driest topic of the day, <laughs> tried to make it as interesting as possible. But raise your hand if you think you're complying with everything that he just mentioned. Oh, good, we've got one. Okay, um, they're pretty. A lot of the requirements are administrative in nature and in the fine print, um, but uh, it's important to comply. So the next CLE announcement, uh, the code is H is in horse, W as in walrus, J as in jack, U as in umbrella, and L as in Larry. That's H, W, J, U, L. One last time, H, W, J, U, L. And now you get to hear from me again. I'm going to talk to you today about commercial item contracting. I would say probably half the people in the room and half the people on the phone have heard my spiel about commercial item contracting. Uh, yet as many times as we go through it, I think they want to go through it again. Uh, and the reason why I picked this topic is because around, I'd say 90% of our clientele provide commercial items to the government, either as a prime contractor or as a subcontractor. And especially over the last year, there's been a lot of important updates in the area of commercial item contracting. Uh, the Department of Defense in particular, in the National Defense Authorization Acts that have been passed over the last few years, has been extremely focused on commercial item contracting and the fact that basically the benefits of commercial item contracting have been eroded over time. And so we'll talk about that. So where did commercial item contracting come from? I'm not going to go as far back in time as Marshall Doak did to 1818, but uh, it goes back to uh, the 1990s where there were historical impediments to contractors wanting to do business with the federal government. Uh, there were commercial companies that just said, nope, that's it. I don't want to do business. I don't want to comply with their accounting requirements. I don't want to comply with their intellectual property requirements. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to deal with all of those onerous administrative requirements. Or the companies who were willing to do that had to build all of that into their pricing. And so the government was paying exorbitant amounts of money for something that uh, commercially you can get at a lesser price. So in October of 1994, the government enacted the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act, known as FASA, and that changed the government's procurement methodology. A key element is that the government's stated preference is for commercial items. That is where they should start. The government's required to do market research to identify commercial items that could satisfy their needs, or identify if there are commercial items that can be modified to satisfy their needs, or if the government can modify its requirements so that it can still acquire commercial items. It also encourages uh, agencies to ensure that the way they're defining their requirements encourage participation of commercial items. So FAFSA revised Federal Acquisition Regulation FAR Part 12 to contain certain policies and procedures that only apply to commercial items, and they have some terms and conditions that more closely resemble the commercial marketplace. They wanted to make it more attractive and easier to do business. You also will see a lot less FAR and DFAR and other agency supplemental flowdowns in commercial item prime contracts and subcontracts. So um, as I mentioned, not only do, does the government have to do market research, but also contractors at every tier are encouraged to the maximum extent practicable to incur incorporate commercial items. So even if you have a non-commercial item prime contract, not only can the prime contractor issue commercial item subcontracts, but they are encouraged to do so. I'm going to take a minute to talk about a case that just came out less than a month ago. That's how timely we are here. But it's an important case because it uh, discusses FASA and the government's obligation to do market research. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this company, but I'm going to call it Palantir. So in this case, the Army was seeking to procure a distributed common ground system and because the original requirement was over 10 years old and the technology was nearing obsolescence. The purpose of the system was to combine the Army's intelligence software and hardware capabilities into one program that could work uh, across all agent Army intelligence command components and other military intelligence systems. So the Army set out to do what they were supposed to do. They did their market research, and they issued a series of requests for information to the public, and they commissioned a series of reports. And uh, the result of some of those reports said you have three options. You can do a purely government developmental, development, uh, government specified, 
acquisition. You can do a commercial procurement, or you could do a hybrid where you combine both. Palantir responded to these RFIs, and they say, we government have a commercial product that will satisfy your needs. It's called the Gotham Platform, and it's been previously purchased by the government as a commercial item, and it's on our GSA multiple award schedule contract. Uh, the government never argued in any of these cases that it wasn't commercial item. They actually stipulated to that. But after looking at the series of reports and analyzing the data, the government said, you know what? Now, we're going to go purely government developmental. We're going to issue a uh, IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract, and we're going to issue a cost reimbursement task order, the most disfavored form of contracting. So Palantir, once that solicitation was issued, they filed a pre-award protest at GAO. Um, that protest was denied. Palantir didn't stop there. They proceeded and filed a subsequent protest at the Court of Federal Claims. And the Court of Federal Claims entered a judgment in Palantir's favor. And what they held was that the Army failed to determine whether there were commercial items that met or could be modified to meet the agency's needs. It said that the agency acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner Guess what happens, Mika? And we're back on. This is very odd. Um, so they said the Army uh, violated FASA, and the court permanently enjoyed the Army from proceeding with a uh, contract under the protested solicitation. And they said that in order to proceed, the Army needed to properly and sincerely comply with FASA before awarding a contract. The Army then uh, appealed that decision to the Court of Federal Claims, to the, or I'm sorry, to the Federal Circuit, and that was the decision that was just issued about a month ago. And the Court of Federal Claims agreed, or I'm sorry, the Federal Circuit agreed with the Court of Federal Claims. They said that the Army was on notice through market research that there were these commercial options available. And that the Army had a market research report that said that this was an option. Uh, they also said that the Army came back and said, well, actually, in our report, we said there were three things we needed that this commercial product didn't have. And they said, but you didn't do any analysis to see if this commercial product could be modified to include that. So while the court noted there wasn't any specific documentation that's required, there needs to be something that the agency documents to show their rationale for their decision so that it could be subject to judicial review. So what are the takeaways for you? If you uh, see an RFI where you have a commercial item that would satisfy the agency's needs, respond to the RFI. If the solicitation still comes out as a FAR Part 15 procurement, non-commercial item, then consider filing a pre-award protest. And also, you know, the only thing that's going to come from this as well is that the agencies are probably going to do a better job documenting their decisions as to why commercial items will not meet their needs. So uh, the government's stated preference for commercial items has meant that in fiscal year 2017, the Department of Defense acquired over $53 million in commercial items. Actually, I think that should be a billion dollars, by the way. Um, that's a bad typo. In term, the commercial item contracts are streamlined to more closely resemble the commercial marketplace with Again, terms and conditions you typically see, inspection, acceptance, warranty, and less FAR and DFAR flowdowns. Uh, FAR Part 12 takes precedence over any other part in the FAR. And why is this a benefit? It's a benefit to the government because it's going to keep your costs lower and it's going to result in better prices for the government. So what is a commercial item? The definition of a commercial item is in FAR 2.101, and there's eight different paragraphs to the definition. I have all the paragraphs in the slides. We're not going to go through them all, but I just want to make sure you had them. Let's break this first one down, though, because this is the most important one when you're talking about goods. So a commercial item is any item that is of a type customarily used by the general public or by non-governmental entities for purposes other than governmental purposes and has either been sold, leased, or licensed, or offered for sale, leased, or licensed to the general public. So let's break that down, of a type. There is no definition in the FAR of of a type. The federal government has complained that it is too broad. Uh, as a representative of contractors, we love that it's very broad. You can drive a truck through that definition, and, and we often do. 
really what it comes down to, and the government has now come out with some guidance saying, what is the primary function and purpose of the product? And is it used by the general public for non-governmental purposes? So what that means is you cannot sell it to Raytheon who, if Raytheon is then selling it to the government. So if you only sell to Raytheon, who then sells it to the government, not a commercial item. Okay? And it's, if it's not of a type, that you can't use that as a commercial sale, even though Raytheon is a commercial entity. Now, if you sell it to them for a commercial application, well, that is what can support a justification of a commercial item. So it has to be for other than governmental purposes, and it also can't be for foreign government purposes. That, that is still a government purpose. So some examples of what would fall in this if we just take a simple example of an engine in a vehicle, right? You have a Ford, you have GM, you have all different makes and models of vehicles. And for every vehicle type, the engine is specifically designed for that vehicle. But guess what? Those are all commercial, correct? So let's take a military vehicle. If the engine has a similar amount of horsepower as what you find in the commercial marketplace, uh, similar functionality, you know, nothing government unique about it, it's a commercial item. And people, my clients will say, well, no, but it's built to spec. It's specifically for this government vehicle. We don't sell the exact same thing anywhere. And I say, it doesn't matter. It just needs to be of a type. You also don't sell the same engine commercially for every vehicle manufacturer. Keep in mind, it just needs to be offered for sale, not even sold. And it doesn't have to be offered for sale or sold by you. So if you only sell it to the government, but your competitors sell something similar that's of a type commercially, you can use that as a justification for commercial item. The next uh, paragraph of definition I'll focus on for a minute is the part that talks about minor modifications. So you can have a commercial item and make a minor modification and it still be considered a commercial item. What's a minor modification for the government? Let's think about um, a component of an armored vehicle and the component needs to maybe be blast protected. In order to do that, you just do a fine coating of, of some sort of product on it. It doesn't really add much to the cost. Uh, it does, you don't really do that blast protection commercially, but it really, it's government unique, but it doesn't really change the purpose of the product, application, anything like that. That would still probably be a minor modification. And when they, there's no dollar value in here, but they usually use maybe a 5% of the value of the product as a guidepost. So if that modification is worth less than 5% of the value of the product, it's probably a minor modification. When you're looking at services, paragraph 5 of the definition says installation, maintenance, repair, or training services that relate to a commercial item or commercial services. Paragraph 6 talks about all other types of services. Now, for services, it actually has to be sold competitively in substantial quantities in the commercial marketplace in order for it to qualify as a commercial item service. Also, for a commercial item good, the determination is two steps. You first determine it's a commercial item. You second look at, is the price fair and reasonable? For commercial item services under this paragraph six, though, in order for it to be a commercial item service, it also has to be at catalog or market prices. So it conflates that two-step into a, a one-step process. The next slide talks about what's a catalog and what's a market price. And then I want to talk about cost items, commercially available off-the-shelf items. Like I said, a lot of my clients will say, no, we don't sell it to the government, or we don't sell it commercially, we just sell it to the government, not a commercial item. And I say, you are talking about a cost item. A cost item is an item that is sold to the federal government and sold commercially in the exact same form, no modification, exactly the same, and it's sold in substantial quantities in the commercial marketplace. That is a COTS item. So a COTS item is a commercial item, but it does not need to be COTS in order for it to be a commercial item. And if you have a COTS product that you are selling, there's additional exemptions that you're subject to under the FAR and DFAR and other acquisition clauses. Commercial items tend to be fixed price or fixed price with an economic price adjustment. That means that the price adjustment is not based on your actual cost experience. Uh, there's limited exceptions for labor hour and time and material contracts. You could still have those types of contracts and have it be commercial item. Uh, GSA multiple award schedule and VA federal supply schedule contracts are all providing commercial item goods or services. Okay, so if you already have your product or service on the schedule, the government has already determined it's a commercial item. And you can use that oftentimes when you're then selling that same product to the government 
under a non-GSA uh, or VA federal supply schedule contract as a basis for saying, hey, government, this is a commercial item. We have it on our schedule. GSA has already acknowledged or VA has acknowledged it's a commercial item. As I mentioned, you can have a commercial item subcontract even if the prime or higher tier subcontract is non-commercial. And if you get pushback from your customer, you point to Clause 52244-6, and you say, well, if you have a non-commercial item prime contract, I bet your prime contract contains 52244-6, and that says you must consider using commercial item subcontracts, and it actually encourages you to do so to the maximum extent practical. And that's a way to politely disagree with them. Commercial item prime contracts use standard form 1449, and I have here... Uh, kind of a snippet of what the top of the form looks like, and that's how you know that the government is issuing a commercial item solicitation or giving you a commercial item prime contract. There are various clauses that are in the fine print in box 27A and B that are always in commercial item prime contracts, solicitations, and contracts. And I have those listed here. In particular, FAR Clause 52.212-4, if you look at that clause, it has several paragraphs that really look like what you see in a commercial purchase order. Inspection acceptance, changes, excusable delays, invoicing, disputes, payment, all these topics listed here. So that is the crux of the terms and conditions that are in commercial item prime contracts. The clauses that are bold and underlined cannot be changed. And typically with FAR clauses, when clients come and say, I love it when they have a prime contract and they redline all the FAR clauses and want to go back to the government with the red line, good luck with that one. You can't redline the clauses. The only negotiation with the government is the clause either does or doesn't apply, and if it applies to you, you're stuck with it. There's an exception there, and that's this clause. The clauses that are not bolded and underlined can be tailored under FAR Part 12. And so if you go to the government and say, our commercial marketplace typically says for one of these terms that this is the standard in the industry, the government will be willing to entertain the idea of modifying these paragraphs. So that's important to know. Um, let's take an example. Paragraph O, warranty. This is what it says. The contractor warrants and implies that the items delivered here under are merchantable and fit for use for the particular purpose described in this contract. Every commercial contract lawyer in the room is cringing because those are the implied warranties of mercantility and fitness for a particular purpose that we always disclaim and we absolutely hate. But that's the default. Um, contractors are permitted under FAR Part 12 to propose their commercial warranty and get rid of these implied warranties. And the government's willing to do that provided that the government still has repair replacement rights in the event of a breach of the warranty. Um, solicitations sometimes will identify your standard warranty terms, so maybe there's duration. We at least want a warranty for 12 months. But if you have a standard warranty you offer commercially, the government should be willing to accept it under the FAR Part 12. The FAR Part 12 commercial item prom contracts also include the 212-5 clause, and this is a check-the-box format. So there's a few clauses in the first paragraph that are in all contracts, but then the rest of them, they only apply if the contracting officer has checked them off. It used to be the DFAR had a similar check-the-box format, but they did away with that, and instead they just say that uh, basically you need to only comply with those DFAR clauses that say they apply to commercial items, and DFAR 212.301 has a list of what those clauses are. So what are the best practices? For a prime contract, know what can and can't be tailored. You're going to waste your time with the government if you're trying to tailor some of the paragraphs that can't be tailored. Um, if you're looking at 212-5 and what's checked off, if the government's required to include it in there based on the policy language in the FAR or DFAR, you're going to waste your time in trying to negotiate those out. But the contracting officers don't always get it right. So anyone from the government in the room, I apologize. Uh, but it, it's sometimes they check off the wrong clauses, and uh, we help clients to identify that. What about commercial item subcontracts? So subcontracts are a hybrid between a government contract and a commercial contract. Government contract rules, statutes, clauses apply to the extent they're actually in your contract. So I love it when, when uh, I'm negotiating on behalf of a subcontractor and the prime says, well, don't worry about all oh, those 100 clauses that won't apply to you. They're self-deleting. Guess what? They're not self-deleting. If they're in your subcontract, they apply to you. Now, the exception to that 
and where we work with contractors if, it, if the contract itself includes some applicability language. So oftentimes after a clause will be our parenthetical that says only applies to contracts over $150,000. Well, if your contract's only $50,000, that's an agreement between you and the other side that it doesn't apply. And, and that will help you. But don't believe them, they're not self-deleting. There's a Christian doctrine which applies to prime contracts, which says that clauses that are fundamental to government contracting are read into prime contracts, even if they're not included in there. Now, notably though, the Christian doctrine has not been applied to subcontracts, with one exception. And that exception is this UPMC Braddock case, which talked about the equal employment opportunity requirements that Miha had mentioned. So that case said that those requirements were read into the subcontract even though they were nowhere in the subcontract. I think the reason they came to that holding though, and they did a footnote on Christian doctrine, but I think the reason they really came to that is the regulations underlying those EEO laws state that the clauses apply even if they're not in your contract. So they didn't even have to go to the Christian doctrine to reach that finding, and we still have yet to see the Christian doctrine applied to other clauses um, with subcontracts. U.S. government subcontracts are also governed by the Uniform Commercial Code. So it is, again, a hybrid between a commercial contract and a government contract. It's important to, when you're reviewing subcontracts, to make sure that the clauses marry one another and, and are not conflicting with one another. So let's take the Changes Clause, right? Uh, Marshall talked about the FAR Changes Clause. Well, a lot of times in your commercial terms and conditions, there's also a paragraph about changes. And so when your customer's slowing you down the Changes Clause, it might conflict with the changes language in the commercial terms and conditions. You'll want to be able to read both and reconcile any conflicts up front rather than after the fact when you have an issue. So what happens if the prime contract's not a commercial item contract? I mentioned the contract will contain 52244-6, which is encourages the use of commercial item subcontracts. Also in that clause is a list of what FAR clauses the prime contractor must include in commercial item subcontracts. That's the starting point, because that's really the only list of what is actually required. And frankly, not all of those clauses are required to be in every contract. So there's a clause about uh, contractors performing private security functions overseas. Probably doesn't apply to most contracts, right? So it only is if it still applies. Um, the Code of Business Conduct Clause Mika talked about is in that list. Well, that only applies if your contract's over $5.5 million with a period of performance longer than 120 days. So even within that list, know which ones should and shouldn't apply to your subcontract. In addition, paragraph C2 says that the prime contractor can flow down a minimal number of additional clauses necessary to satisfy their contractual obligations. Well, that has meant that prime contractors say, we flow everything down to you. Everything's critical. And we push back on that on behalf of clients all the time. That said, there are some clauses that don't require flow down that prime contractors should want to flow down for business purposes. That's termination for convenience. What happens if the government terminates you for convenience? Well, you need to be able to terminate your subcontractor for convenience. Otherwise, you're on the hook to continue paying your subcontractor for goods or services you no longer need, right? So we as subcontractors get it. We understand that, but that doesn't mean, prime contractor, that I need to accept a termination for convenience that's not government-directed. So if it's government-directed, we'll accept it, but you still can't have the right to terminate us for your own convenience, and so we try to parse that out. If the prime contract is not a commercial item prime contract, also it will contain this DFAR clause. Um, as I mentioned, it, the clause says that the prime shouldn't flow down any clauses that aren't required for commercial item subcontractors but they still have the minimal number of additional clauses necessary to satisfy contractual obligations language. So again, it, it's kind of given the primes and higher tier subcontractors carte blanche to include everything. If the prime contract is a commercial item contract, it contains that check the box clause, 212-5, and in paragraph E1 of that clause, it also includes a list of this is what you must include in commercial item subcontracts. It's close to what's in 244-6, but it's actually not exactly the same, not clear why. Um, but also it has the right for the prime to flow down some additional clauses. So the prime contractor, higher tiered subcontractor, you have more bargaining power, you're the customer. Um, know that there are some clauses that must be flowed down. There are some clauses though that don't apply to subs at all. Uh, Marshall talked about the disputes clause that actually doesn't provide, apply to subcontractors. The claims process, contract disputes act, 
doesn't apply to subs. So if that's the only disputes clause you have in your contract, you don't really have a disputes clause. What about the electronic funds transfer? As Misha said, that is done through SAM. Well, that's not required for subcontractors. That's not how you get paid. You get paid from your customer. It doesn't make sense to include those clauses in here. Uh, so also, the subcontractor might only be performing a subset of the prime's requirements. So you might have a prime contract for the sale of goods, but you're subcontracting out some testing services or some coding services. Those are services. In that case, you're going to want to flow down the service type clauses to your subcontractor, not those that apply to goods. What happens if you have a cost plus fixed fee prime contract and you're issuing a fixed price subcontract? You're going to want to flow down the fixed price version of the changes clause and termination clause. You're not going to want to flow down the cost reimbursement version. So you have to be a little nuanced in this, and frankly, that's why I still have a job. Clients always want the guidebook as to, you know, we could do this once, right, for one contract and we never have to do it again. It's actually the right way to do it is for each contract. And so we can help you come up with some uh, shortcuts to a certain extent that might cover you 90% of the way, but the government really anticipates you do this on a contract-by-contract -contract basis. From the subcontractor's perspective, know what you can push back on and what you can't. Know when the clause says this must be included in all subcontracts. You're going to waste your breath trying to push back on that one. And know what the prime contractor needs to do to cover themselves from a business perspective, but push back where necessary so that the prime contractor isn't using that to expand upon rights that they probably shouldn't have. Uh, this is just a list if we want to look at what when you're pushing back on your uh, customer as to, no, I'm a commercial item subcontract, I'm exempt from these requirements. The sections of the FAR and DFAR that specifically identify the laws and regulations from which subcontractors are exempt. One of those exemptions, uh, which is the one that typically, when I tell clients about the Truthful Cost or Pricing Data Statute, nor, formerly known as Truth and Negotiations Act. Frankly, I liked TINA. It was easy to say. Truthful Cost or Pricing Data is a mouthful. So I still call it TINA. I'm, I'm rebelling. Um, but the requirement is you have to give the government your cost or pricing data, anything that a prudent buyer or seller would want to know when negotiating price. Such a fair level playing field with the government. Um, it requires certification that you are giving the government everything and everything you're giving them is current and accurate. And so your certification says it's current, accurate, and complete. And guess what? If you miss something and the government audits and they can audit for up to three years after final payment, they can come back and reduce your price. This sounds so fair, doesn't it? Well, commercial item prime contracts and subcontracts are exempt from this requirement. Cost accounting standards, onerous accounting requirements. I'm not going to go into details here, but commercial item contracts are exempt. Audit. Who wants to get audited by the government and have them go through all your cost records? Commercial item contracts provided their fixed price and not time and material or labor hour are exempt from this clause. Changes. Uh, we heard Marshall talk a lot about the government being able to unilaterally make changes. Guess what? Commercial and prime contracts, they don't. They, all changes need to be mutually agreed upon between the parties. Intellectual property protection. There's a presumption that technical data and computer software for commercial items was developed exclusively at private expense, and it's up to the government to rebut that presumption. There's also relaxed marking requirements. Um, if you have a non-commercial item prime contract and you're submitting technical data to the government that was developed exclusively at private expense, you have to have a limited rights legend on it. You fail to include that legend and you don't notice that the government can have unlimited rights in that. There goes your technical data, there goes your drawing. Uh, for commercial items, there isn't that same marking requirement, so you can include your standard commercial legend without getting government pushback. You also have the ability to negotiate standard commercial licenses with the government. Um, FAR 12.211, with respect to technical data, says the government acquires only technical data and the rights in that technical data that are customarily provided to the public with the commercial item. FAR 12.212, about computer software, says commercial computer software shall be acquired under licenses customarily provided to the public to the extent such licenses are consistent with federal law and otherwise satisfy the government's requirements. So that's where you point to when you see the non-commercial item 
data rights clauses in your contract, you say, nope, you only get these licenses because this is what FAR Part 12 says for commercial items and commercial computer software. Mika talked about small business subcontracting plans. Those do still apply to commercial item prime contracts if you meet the dollar thresholds. However, they do not apply to commercial item subcontracts. So what are some of the key takeaways here? The government has a stated preference to acquire commercial item goods and services. So does your product that you're selling or service you're providing to the government or your customer meet the definition of a commercial item? Uh, the government, as I said, has been really focused in all of the requirements that have been getting flowed down and applied to commercial item contractors. So they came up with a panel, and it's called the Section 809 panel, and they issued Volume 1 of their report in January of 2018. And in the report, they said the mechanics of flowing down clauses are administratively complex, costly, and time-consuming. We all spend a lot of time negotiating these contracts, preparing flow downs. Um, contractors have to look at each clause to see if it flows down and when, and confirm their ability to comply with these requirements. Um, they, the panel said they've attributed a lot of this growth due to the fact that Congress is not clear when they have a new law as to whether or not the clause applies to commercial items. And so really the push has been for Congress to expressly state that, and if they are silent on it, to assume it doesn't apply to commercial items, as opposed to the opposite, which we've seen, is if it's been silent, then they apply it to commercial items just in case. Um, I'm going to touch briefly about on price analyses, because as I mentioned, with commercial item goods, it's first commercial item determination, but you still have the price analysis that is required. And a price analysis is an analysis of your price without looking at your individual cost and profit elements. In terms of doing a price analysis, either by the government or a prime contractor, the preference is to first look at competition, what are the proposed prices that are in response to a solicitation, or then looking at prices that are compared to historical prices paid either by the government or by the uh, commercial marketplace. So once it's determined it's a commercial item, you can then use prior government sales to justify your price as fair and reasonable. It's not limited to just commercial sales. And you can use commercial sales of, an, of a type item. It doesn't have to be that exact same item. One resource to look at is GSA Advantage. See what your competitors are selling similar products for. So in January of 18, uh, Department of Defense issued a guidebook for acquiring commercial items, and Part A talks about commercial item determinations, and Part B talks about pricing commercial items. It's important if you're a commercial item contractor to review this. I find it extremely helpful because it has a lot of great examples about commercial item determinations the government has previously made, and it gives examples for each of those definitions of a commercial item in FAR 2.101. It gives examples of what is and is not considered to be a commercial item based on the government's real experience and um, determinations they've issued. It also takes a look at pricing considerations, and I'm sure a lot of you in here, especially if you are a subcontractor, have had your prime say, look, I need to do a price analysis. Please give me all your cost data. It's just going to make it easier. And, you, and then you push back, and you have this push and pull, and, they, and then it's up to you as a subcontractor to give them your pricing data and evidence of prior sales to get them comfortable that your price is fair and reasonable. Um, this really focuses on the fact that both for the government and prime contractors, first, they're supposed to look at prior government sales, and the government's supposed to look at what information is available to the government within the government to determine if the price is fair and reasonable. Second, they go to public resources like FedMall or GSA Advantage. And third, they go to the offeror as their last resort. That's not the first step. You have to do all your homework first. Uh, Department of Defense issued a final rule in January 31st of 2018 that says a contracting officer may presume that a prior commercial item determination from the Department of Defense can serve as a commercial item determination for future procurements. So the problem is the Department of Defense does not share information, and they came up with this portal where commercial item determinations are supposed to be put up there, and if you ever looked at it, it's pretty sparse. Uh, so this is an incentive where if you know that the Department of Defense has already determined your product is a commercial item under a prior procurement, that should be enough to get the subsequent procurement to also be commercial item. 
However, it does not require Department of Defense contracting officers to rely on non-DOD commercial item determinations, such as for the VA or GSA. They still have to make their own independent determination, but it could still be used as evidence that it's a commercial item. Um, the contracting officer needs to do market research to inform their price reasonableness determinations, and only if the market research is insufficient do they then go to the offeror for information. When we talked about the definition of a commercial item and an offer for sale, this rule makes it clear that it could include an advertisement on your website. That's enough to make it offered for sale. Uh, sales orders, quotes, any information that demonstrates that a similar item has been offered for sale in the commercial marketplace. Uh, DOD has a group of experts in DCMA that are supposed to help contracting officers with these commercial item determinations and price reasonableness analyses. And the prime contractors are responsible for exercising the same due diligence as the government. Um, as I said, I've seen a push in putting the onus on the commercial item determinations and price analyses onto the subcontractor, and to a certain extent that makes sense. Nobody knows your product better than you. You know how similar it is or different it is from other products that you sell or what your competitors sell. So when we represent subcontractors, we want to help the primes get comfortable but at the end of the day, it is the prime's responsibility to make that commercial item determination. There's a Department of Defense proposed rule going along with the National Defense Authorization Act incentive to look at are these laws and clauses really supposed to apply to commercial item contracts. So it identifies FAR and DFAR clauses that don't apply to commercial item prime contracts and subcontracts and the acquisition of COTS. Notice this is just a proposed rule, so it's not in effect yet. It also includes in the DFAR a narrower definition of subcontract. So we always struggle when clients say, well, what subcontracts do I need to actually include these flow downs in? And one of the kind of unknown areas is inventory. So let's say you keep a bunch of widgets in inventory, some you use on commercial programs, some on government programs. Do you have to include the FAR and DFAR clauses in all those purchase orders to the supplier for those widgets? And this new definition says, no, you don't. So if you have a bin in inventory, um, and you use it for multiple programs, both for the government and otherwise, then you do not, it does not fall in the definition of a subcontract, and therefore you would not need to flow down the clauses. Note it talks, in, the clause talks about commodities, and there's no definition of a commodity in the, as of now. The next uh, topic about commercial supplier agreements. Uh, this is a GSA final rule, and uh, for those of you who sell software to the government or have some other terms of service or EULAs that you submit to the government, uh, a lot of times you'll get pushback from the government because there's provisions in there the government just can't accept. And so the GSA has come out with some guidance as to here are the provisions that the government really can't accept in those license agreements. And so there's an acknowledgement that they will accept your license agreement provided it doesn't conflict with these provisions. So these unenforceable clauses that are going to be listed take precedence over your, any conflicting provisions in your commercial supply agreement. You can avoid this back and forth, though, by using this clause as helpful guidance as to how to modify your standard commercial agreement or license so that it's more acceptable to the government and you don't have to engage in this back and forth with them or have any ambiguity as to whether or not it's an enforceable, unenforceable clause that's going to get kicked out and take priority over what's actually in your license agreement. Here are the lists of some, not all, of the unenforceable clauses in this new rule. Uh, one, for example, no automatic renewals. It's a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act because you need appropriations. You can't have just automatic renewals. Same thing with indemnification. The government cannot agree to indemnify the contractor. Uh, a lot of times the contractors want to have confidentiality provisions in there, but um, you, the government is subject to the Freedom of Information Act, so they can't agree to broad confidentiality. Uh, the next case that I want to go into a little detail on is the Syasoft case, because uh, this talks about license agreements, and it had a great holding for contractors. So Syasoft had in the prime contract that they were going to provide 20 single user licenses of their translation software. That was their deliverable. So they delivered to the government 20 CDs of their software under a commercial item prime contract. 
And in the box with the CDs, they included their standard license agreement. With each CD in the shrink wrap, there was a short form license agreement. And then as it got installed on computers, there was also a click accept function. Now typically, SIASOF requires contractors and companies to, um, or their customers, to register the software in order to download it. However, they knew that this was going to remote areas where there wasn't going to be access to Internet. So they didn't want to put that burden on the government, but they said, government, you need to give us a list of who those 20 users are. And also, you can't download this on more than one computer. Well, SciSoft had a way to track the downloads, and they saw the government was violating the 20 single-use uh, license agreement. And so they submitted a claim to the government. The government denied the claim, and they appealed to the Armed Service Board of Contract Appeals. The Armed Service Board of Contract Appeals concluded that the government breached the license agreement by having t more than 20 of these licenses. Notably, the contract did not contain FAR Clause 52.227-19 that was noted in the Board's decision because that could have potentially broadened the scope of the commercial license. Uh, this is what the board held. They said the government can be bound by the terms of a commercial software license that it has not seen and has not negotiated prior to entering in the contract. The government's position was, yes, okay, maybe this was included with the shipment and the shrink wrap, the click accept. It was never given to us before a contract award. The board said it doesn't matter. They are bound by something they've never seen, which is fantastic for contractors. Um, they said that the government had an implied duty of good faith and fair dealing to protect the software from unauthorized use. And it also talked about the government said, well, this isn't really commercial computer software because they modified it so that we wouldn't have to register. And they said, no, that wasn't enough of a modification to bring it outside the realm of commercial computer software. So what's the takeaway here? Still, if you're selling software to the government, include your license in your proposal. Include it as an attachment to the prime contract. You don't want to find yourself in this position and make sure in that license agreement it's acceptable to the government and doesn't have any unenforceable provisions that we went through. Um, but also you want to make sure that it is similar to that you offer commercially, except for those government-only modifications. One of the key holdings here is that this license agreement that SIASOF was providing to the government was similar to that it provides commercially, and that's a key. Uh, we have clients who come to us with their software, and they want to say to the government, you only get our standard license. And I say, okay, <laughs> send me a copy of your standard license. But they don't have one. That's not good. Uh, last confirmed that the contract doesn't contain FAR Clause 52.227-19. I see a lot of commercial item prime contracts for commercial computer software. The government throws that in there, and we have to have a battle as to whether or not that applies or the client's license, and you don't want to be in a position of trying to compare the two. And the last topic is the e-commerce portal. It's been a hot topic, but the government um, is required to establish a program to procure commercial products through this e-commerce portal. And the government's still in the process of doing their planning and research for it. But basically, this is not, it can't be an existing system. So it's not FedMall, it's not GSA Advantage. I'd say it's something more akin to Amazon, right? Where you, the government can just go on. It has to be all COTS products, so it cannot be services and it cannot be commercial items. It's only for cost products. Um, and it doesn't include something that, uh, like I said, is currently managed by the government. And it also, these purchases will not exceed the simplified acquisition threshold. Okay? So it's for smaller purchases. It makes a lot of sense for them to have something like this. Uh, phase implement one implementation plan was delivered in March of 2018, but it really isn't going to be rolled out until year 2020. But if you are a provider of COTS products, you might want to start uh, getting your lobbying arm going and make sure that the type of product you sell is something that's going to be offered on the e-commerce portal. So that brings us exactly to the time for the last Q&A session. So are there any questions in the room? Mikhail, do you want to join me? There's a mic over there. Any questions? Done silence? Hungry? Anything, Krista, from the computer? Let's do this one first and then. So one of the questions that you received online was that some government CPSR auditors are saying that SBSPs must be obtained 
even if a commercial item is being bought by the prime from the vendor? How can you reconcile that fact with the information in the presentation, which said that that's not the case? I'm sorry, what was the acronym that you said, the S? Uh, some government CPSR auditors are saying that SBSPs must be obtained, even if a commercial item is oh. being bought. Small Business Subcontracting Plan, got it. <laughs> I wasn't used to that acronym. Um, you know, the, you point in the paragraph J in, in the FAR clause, which says that if the prime contract contains FAR 52.212-5, or, the, or if there's a subcontract issued under a prime contract that contains that, or if it's a subcontract issued under a prime contract that contains 52.244-6, then you shouldn't require a small business subcontracting plan. So that basically covers all commercial item subcontracts. So I point them to that paragraph of the clause and politely tell them they're wrong. One additional question was in terms of the no self-deleting clauses. Can you restate or recommend how to push back on removing non-applicable clauses from a prime contractor in the sense that if it's in the prime contract, it must be in the subcontract? Okay, so uh, the, so really what we do, as I said, is we recommend adding a parenthetical after the clause. So, for example, let's take the uh, restrictions on lobbying clause. It only applies to subcontracts over $150,000. So what I would add is I wouldn't strike out the clause because, again, a lot of customers get a little um, nervous about that, but add a parenthetical that says does not apply to orders over or under $150,000. And each clause, pretty much it's usually the last paragraph of the clause, um, will have some language that states when it does and doesn't apply. Or you can go to um, even the prescription clause for prime contracts. So if it's a clause that only applies to construction prime contracts, I think you could argue it should only apply to construction subcontracts. And if you're not a construction subcontractor, it shouldn't apply. But again, you add a parenthetical that says only applies to orders for construction work. So that's how you kind of limit the application. And we do a lot of that for clients. So we have one final question. If a company is selling an item or service commercially, who, how exactly is that service or item defined in the commercial context in the sense that is it determined by the market or by some other company's price list? So if a company sells their item to, for example, a prime contractor, is their item then deemed commercial based on the prime contractor's use of that item, or how does it affect them? Good question. The answer is no, it doesn't, and that's, that's the issue. So I have, you know, you can be selling a component to an MRAP vehicle, okay? Mine-resistant ambush protection vehicle. That's not a commercial item. You don't quite see them driving down the highway. But if you have a component to that vehicle that is of a type of a component that is in any vehicle on the road, then that's a commercial item. So you don't look at the application as to what the government's buying. You look at the application for the component that you are providing to the prime. Anything else? Okay. Well, I do want to thank everyone for coming today, and I want to thank all the speakers for traveling here. I also want to introduce the other Foley lawyers. I know, if you stand up, I fill in here. Okay. You might have stepped out for a call. Phil Phillips is our office managing partner of our Detroit office, so if you see him during lunch, introduce yourself and say hi. And as I said, Krista Nunez is here from our Washington, D.C. office, and she does government contract work as well. I want to give a very special thank you to Donna Bartolotti, who's out at the registration desk. I'm, if you've been here before, you see her year after year. Not only is she my assistant, but she runs this whole show. So um, please give her your thanks for all the hard work and blood, sweat, and tears that went into the program and these fantastic booklets you have in front of you. And please, please fill out your um, critique sheet and stay for lunch. We do invite you to do so. It will give you a chance to talk to each other, talk to us, and enjoy this lovely food that Schoolcraft has prepared for us. So thank you.